What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, where since the year of 2008, we've been bringing you audiological goodness, interviews with scholars from the ivory tower, be they theologians, biblical scholars, philosophers, scientists, and the like. These individuals are wrestling professionally with those big questions human beings have been asking around campfires for generation upon generations. And that's what we're here to do. Because we don't want to think for you, we want to think with you. And this episode's a special one because it's a two-parter. Why? Why? Why is that? Because it's an invitation um, to our brand new, launched last night, homebrewed Christianity reading group. It's called Upsetting the Powers, Exploring the Life and Legacy of James Cone, the Father of Black Theology. And this episode's a two-parter because uh, unique to this uh, reading group uh, that I'm partnering with Adam Clark, uh, black theologian, student of James Cone, friend of the pod. What we're partnering to do is not only uh, wrestle with James Cone's writing, his legacy and stuff, but also get to know the theologian, his context, his history and pe- from people that know him. Um, and and that's why this is two-parter, because part one, this is what happens in our live sessions each Tuesday, um, is is we hang out, we wrestle, ask questions, engage with all the people in the group, uh, some text around a theme. This week's theme was Theology Matters. And then, uh, in addition, the second half of each week, uh, and not on Tuesday, but whenever you have time and space in your life to enjoy, is a conversation between Adam and... And, and an academic who knows and works uh, with James Cone. And today's uh, conversation, the second half of this episode, is between Serene Jones, the president of Union Theological Seminary in New York. Uh, and, and it is, I mean, she, she's an amazing uh, scholar and theologian in her own right. And she talks about what her relationship with James Cone's like, the way his theology uh, impacted. Uh, how he was uh, a scholar, how he was a teacher, um, uh, how he engaged uh, the public. Uh, You'll get to hear personal, intimate stories about an amazing, influential theologian, but you'll also get to hear some of the fire and power in Serene's own voice as a courageous leader at Union Theological Seminary. Um, So, yeah, there are these two elements each week. I wanted to give everyone a taste to lure you over to jamesconewasright.com. That's right. If you go to jamescohnwasright.com, you can join this group and you'll get access to each and every week's material. Um, (laughs) And and they're all on a page for members that sign up for the class. Uh, You'll get the uh, you'll get invitations to join the sessions live. But if you don't, you'll get the audio and video of both um, our, our live stream sessions on Tuesday, the conversations Adam is doing each week as well. So it's it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. And the best part is this class is donation based. So you can give zero to a million dollars anywhere in between, because what we really want is to get to introduce um, as many people as possible uh, to the theological legacy of James Cone, because I believe that we the future of the church has a lot to learn from black theology and specifically from James Cone's voice. So, uh, yeah, here we go. This is session one, and I hope you come and join the fun at jamesconewasright.com. Do you have any any opening uh, questions, comments, thoughts, framings for everything that's going to happen? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm very excited to be here. And um, we have a series of guests with us that really talk about cone in a very intimate and personal way. I mean, we hear about Cohn as a great kind of theologian, but we don't th- think about Cohn as friend, as mentor, as teacher. So in addition to the dialogue that Tripp and I are going to have about the kind of content of Black theology, we're going to have some additional content with people who talk about Cohn's kind of persona, uh, Cohn as a colleague, Cone as a mentor, and they drop some beautiful stories, stories that they never told anybody else. We have them first exclusively for you about some insights into the character of the personhood of James Cone, 
right? And also what he was like as a classroom teacher, right? So most people, you know, see Cone as some type of distant figure standing on top of the theological malady, writing kind of, you know, these kind of lofty or kind of maybe acerbic prescriptions about justice and about, um, uh, you know, a firebrand theology. Um, and that's part of him, but there are other parts of him. There's a warmth, there's a tenderness to the man. There was a certain loving, um, um, justice loving and person loving, you know, orientation toward him. So you can hear all of that in, in some of the, the um, um, our interlockers for this semester. Okay, so, um, you know, one of our goals this time was to do these sessions um, in ways that, that shifted what happened before. Before, we did, we did different black theologians visited as guests. We also had uh, conversations that were deep dives where you did your day job for us, you know, where you did intensive lectures, and then we discussed. And our goal this time was to go back and forth and make it more conversational around the themes um, and, and, and then to have Adam's conversations, uh, with, with the interviews, uh, be in, in, a, in a, a, an equally important part, uh, for two purposes, uh, we'll at least tell you why we thought it was a good idea. And then you can decide if it was, um, one, a number of the questions and comments that came in last time about reading cone, especially for those that were doing it, uh, for the first time, uh, mostly, uh, the, the kind of white Christians that finally had a that that got shook right during the black lives matter protest uh were unsure as how to even voice the kind of questions that come up if you're trying to wrestle with the topic and this is new and so uh one of the goals in our conversations was to uh like i reread everything today for this and then we'll reread it each week and we'll try to not just voice my own questions at the being the nerd talking to another nerd, but my intuitions about my experience in the life of the church and say and ask the awkward questions. So you watch friends talk about it and it hopefully gives everyone permission to do so in their own context, right? Because if you remember the reading today uh, about the greatest sin of white theology is silence. Part of the reason uh, there's silence is because no one wants to look like a fool. So I'm volunteering to look like a fool and uh, be <laughs> reprimanded and corrected. Um, and, uh, and that's only half in jest because I can guarantee it will happen. Um, the other <laughs> side is that Homebrew Christianity, I have over 1,300 episodes, 1,300 of me asking wow. people questions. Yeah. And that's when Adam amazing. and I were talking about this and having guests, I said, Adam, I want you to do the interviews. Well, mm. why don't we do them together, blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, like there are, Every question that comes out of trip comes from my context and situation. I think it's really helpful to hear the questions that comes uh, when not just from own, Adam's own context as a black theologian, but in relationship to these individuals that are a part of the union community and people that know and love Cone. I can guarantee you, uh, having worked through a lot of uh, <laughs> these, uh, these conversations, there's stuff I could have never got out and a comfortability of friends. So like, uh, this is a theological experiment, uh, and I just, you know, uh, I just want to say thank you, Adam, for, you know, doing it. And I'm super excited because, um, like, I think it only works because you're my friend and mm. we can trust each other enough to mm. to figure it out. And uh, and I'll remind everyone this in an email, but listen to this. At some point in the next week or so. Apple is going to approve a new podcast called Upsetting the Powers, where all the interviews for this class will end up on. And from the moment it gets approved, I'm going to annoy every one of you in every email to go subscribe, rate, and review so that there's like a theology podcast that is Adam Clark interviewing other epic theologians. Because if you go scroll through those big theology podcasts, not a lot of high quality ones. And the number of high quality ones has marginally grown since I started Homebrew in 2008. Um, every megachurch preacher's on there. Uh, anyway. Krista Tippett better watch out. She better watch out. 
I know. I know. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a new kid on the block. Upsetting the powers. Here we go. I'm super. I, anyway, I'm super. I'm super excited. I excited enough. Elgin, when I was coming down here, and I was like, he's like, your teacher. I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, you're really excited about this. What is it? Lord of the Rings? And I was like, no, <laughs> James Cone. <laughs> he's like, he must be doing some Middle Earth thing. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, so Adam, I have three very vague, open-ended questions I want to ask before getting specific. Here we go. Um, and here's the first one. How did you meet James Cone? And when you met him, what was the idea of him you took into the meeting? And then when you, through the process of working, how did your encounter and experience of him change from when he was a voice on a text to yeah. your mentor? You, that's a great, you know what? No one's ever asked me that question. That's such a thoughtful question. Um, okay. Well, I'll do both. I'll talk about when I first encountered him and also when I physically met him. I first encountered him when I was, um, I went to Colgate University as an undergrad and I was actually there. Um, I guess they had a pre-freshman weekend as a high school person. And I stayed with uh, a woman who's now a theologian at Emory University named Diane Stewart. And she was taking a class. I can't remember if it was a theology because also Josiah Young, another James Cone student, student who wrote Pan-African Theology and wrote something on Bonhoeffer. He was teaching at Colgate at the time. And he was teaching liberation theology. And I remember her talking so passionately about poetry and theology and just talking about this theme of liberation that came from she talked about Gutierrez and Cohn, and I hadn't heard of either of them. And I remember her passion was so striking and her way of saying, I'm not really with church, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's awesome. And I had never heard it that way. And it made me so curious that when I actually enrolled at Colgate, I pursued a class with Josiah Young and I pursued just liberation theology. And at the time it was in the context of a social movement at the, also. And I said, this type of theology is so compatible for justice. It just, um, it, um, it was so persuasive. It just, it just fit. It just fit this type of Christianity. So I, I, I just consumed just um, not just black theology, but all forms of liberation theology. And I was excited by it. And I, and I, and I embraced it as my new personal truth. Now, when I actually met James Cohn, uh, that's more directly to the question. First of all, what's most shocking is usually his voice. When you read him, the silent voice in your head is probably like a baritone, but he has such a high pitched voice. It was a little unsettling at first. Um, so first, the voice, right? And then secondly, I remember going to his apartment at the time and sitting down. And this is when I was going to be, I was a prospective doctoral student. And I was told that, you know, you should meet the person you want to study with for four plus years. Uh, so I went up and I had a meeting with him. He accepted the meeting. And I remember just sitting down and looking above my head and seeing God of the oppressed in like 14 different languages, in English, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Korean, and some others. And I remember being so impressed because I thought of myself as a serious student and then looked at him and his serious demeanor. And I said, that's serious. This man is serious about what he's about. And I was so compelled by that, that I really gravitated to just his passion and his seriousness and his accomplishment. And I said, if a little bit of that could rub off on me, I'll be okay. And, and so, um, so when was it that you, you know, end up in at Union? Like at what point in his career? Uh, did you get there? Uh, this was probably, oh, what year? It was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. 
it was nine. So he was already established. Right. I mean, he was already very well. This is after Malcolm and Martin. So he was probably the second half of his career. Um, already like an international legend. And also, I think he was active in something called EATWAT, which is the mm-hmm. ecumenical ecumenical organization of third world theologians. So what I think at the part he was first taking, he was, he was finished with Malcolm and Martin and he was looking at black theology from an international perspective, trying to connect with both African theologians, Latin yeah. American theologians, Korean theologians, um, and theologians from globally around the world. I remember them coming to his house and, um, all and even progressive European theologians, yeah, and really having dialogues. And I wish at the time I had recording equipment that I could just be a bug on the wall because those conversations must have been amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the the second uh, uh, question is: when people find out that you were a student of James Cone, um, what do they not know? If they dev- they've only met him on the page, like what yeah. it, what is it that having spent those four years working with him, and then as people discover when they hear more about his uh, how he understood his vocation as a theologian of the church, he had a deep investment in his students. It wasn't like I got you to graduate now go on. Um, and so so what is it people don't get if they are only reading books, making him a baritone, and uh, only hearing the fire. Well, that, that's a great question also. Um, what they don't know about him the most, and, and, and part of it also is what I didn't know. I assume because most people I met were so um, zealous about Cone that they almost became, they almost proselytized about his work. He doesn't do that at all. Like, he, they don't know that he is an intellectual's intellectual, how broad he is. People try to see him just as black theology alone, but his interests were the world were so expansive and he read so wide, so widely. Um, so one of the things that I think people would probably um, be surprised to find out is that he doesn't really he doesn't want to create more James Cones. He wants you. He wants you to. He wants you to speak out of your authentic voice. Um, he says. He, he says his, his version of Black theology was carved out of the social movements that shaped him. That is the Black Power movement and the Civil Rights movement. But that's not necessarily the same thing that shaped you. So he encouraged people to start from where they are to carve theology out of their own identity using the theme of liberation and solidarity with the poor from their particular context and not and to be inspired by his, but not to reproduce his. Mm-hmm. That's what I think people would be surprised by. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, the, uh, you know, going into... Uh, spending time intensely with James Cone and his legacy uh, means you're going to constantly be wrestling with how you even understand uh, black theology. And uh, the uh, Hopkins article we read this week you know, gives a historical overview and then some common themes. Um, uh, Cone's uh, article that we read, I think, demonstrates uh, what in the academy – Cone was brushing up against uh, how the silence of theologian shows up. And obviously that extends not just to religion as a discipline or theologians or the church, but to culture at large. Um, and in Serene's article, you can see how that that same uh, fear, right, of being honest uh, about our history and the consequences shows up that in her essay, she is exploring uh, the response in, in edu- around education to critical race theory. Um, you know, I think it's like because of the impact of black theology, a lot of what's said about it gets mixed with what the enemies say, uh, Mm. just like Mm. critical race theory. Right. And, and then what its proponents say. So if you were constructing like, you know, the first few sentences of the Wikipedia article or, uh, or the tweet that you're just like, 
when someone's like, well, I can't believe in black theology because I'm white, you know, or whatever the dumb, <laughs> I, if you want me to dramatically read some emails from ministers, I, I swear, uh, I've gotten some interesting responses from white people that are ordained yeah. about us doing this class. And I always think to myself, I, you're, you're, you're proving Cone's point, you know? Um, mm. But if, if, if someone is new to this and they're showing up and they're wanting to begin to take seriously this movement, are there, are, what are the positive statements about black theology that are, you, you think we need to like put in ink now? And are there boogeyman versions that we just need to cut out and go like, if this is what you're worried about, just set it aside. And then when you get done, decide if it's worth wasting time about. Yeah. Well, the boogeyman version, I guess, first, because the boogeyman version came out during um, 2007 with Jeremiah Wright, right? Like that's the, and the goddamn America, right? So what fears most white pastors and theologians is black anger, right? Black, black rage, right? But Rage can be a pathway to God, too, because to be rageful, um, I'll give them something they can relate to, maybe. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel said the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. If you have someone's raging, raging is a relational, actually, emotion. If I'm mad at you, it's because I'm in relationship to you. To actually be indifferent is really the opposite of love. So the idea of rage, of anger, right, is not something that is unspiritual, uh, unfaithful. The prophets were raging, right? There's a certain holiness to that anger, especially at the birth of Black theology. And there could be a holiness to the anger about racial injustice. And anybody who's met Cone can know that even though he was tough, he was deeply principled. It wasn't this type of, I want to beat you up in a personal way, and I say verb beat you up, I mean personally beat you up, or give you a verbal lash. It wasn't some type of immaturity. It was a deep sense of, about the profound injustice due to white supremacy and race, that it, it, a divine discontent, let's put it that way. And what Cohn writes in his first book, Black Theology of Black Power, is that you can't have divine love without divine wrath. Love and wrath are two sides of the same coin, right? So the embodiment of that wrath, because love has been so violated, right, becomes the emergence of Black and liberation theology. And if you don't have that as a paradigm, if you think that spirituality or faithfulness is all about harmony, I would tell you oppression is harmonious. Subjugation is harmonious, right? Love and justice are disruptors of that type of harmony. So to take that as your standpoint and position is the first step in trying to understand the emergence of a Black theology. Oh, that's great. Um, so, so the last kind of broad intro question is about our our present moment today. Um, you know, the, we could have structured the class a lot of ways. We could have picked a lot of different readings, and choosing to focus on Cone and his legacy, where we're getting to know a theologian. Um, not just in his text, but in his relationships. And then in the ripples, in a sense, like if Cone was a rock that went through the water, there are ripples that come out, and we'll be exploring those as well uh, in the class. Uh, when you think of today and the the kind of questions and tensions, the cultural anxieties and stressors and such that are, are, are alive, um, do you have wisdom or advice for how to hear and read and wrestle with Cone? Like, are there, are there particular things we're dealing with today that we go, ah, this is why we need to listen deeply? 
Wow, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, we talked mostly about that. Mostly James Cone's voice comes out when there's racial upheaval, right? So the Black Lives Matter is when people started to, um, his name started to emerge because his theme was liberation of, uh, the theme of liberation in which he addressed was so much about racial captivity and racial bondage, right? So usually when there's a type of protest, you give a way of him to think clearly, but I would say that, you know, that that's a first step. But for Cohn, it's not just that. There's also a certain solidarity with the disenfranchised, right? There's a certain solidarity with the poor because blackness is not mean phenotypically black. It's a metaphor. It's not skin color. It's not biology, which he talked about blackness and black theology. It was a metaphor to talk about those at the bottom the Matthean I-25 idea of the least of these, right? That's what he meant by Black theology. Black theology means being in solidarity with the least of these. So for me, James Cohn is not just something that comes up episodically. It's the orientation to the world. It's an orientation to all that exists. So for me, the Black theological frame is an interpretive posture, not just an affirmative kind of theological construct, but it's a way of interpreting all reality to say that justice happens from the bottom up, not from the top down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. So I'm excited about this. The The theme is of, of the reading and hopefully the rest of the conversation is theology matters. Right. And um, oh, I'm hearing that background noise again. It was. Oh, yeah. Earlier. OK. Do you hear yeah, that's that's I, I'm actually in an office and it keeps oh. going in and out because it's a cold day. I'm going to try to move while we're talking. But go ahead. OK, just hit mute on your thing and I'll I'll vamp about it because I had thoughts and okay. you can listen and then we'll talk back. Um, so uh, the theme today is theology matters. Uh, and I'll go ahead and say the three things that I was going to lay out in conversation. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree, Jim. Uh, Adam is already uh, ripped and raring to go. So, uh, But the theme today, th- Theology Matters, and why it's important, especially uh, for uh, us in this present moment to take seriously, is that James Cone put on the agenda – um, that that theology is not uh, something that can exist as an abstraction. And one of the most powerful uh, lies that that, uh, that that privilege and uh, kind of systems of domination uh, use is that they essentialize an abstraction. And so what happens, let's say, with Christian theology, and I'm using scare quotes if you're using uh, the audio, um, is that Christian theology is abstracted from its context and its origin, right, in the peasant Jesus, the Jew who uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, right? Like you abstract it from its material and historical conditions, and then um, you essentialize it through an interpretation. And if you notice what happens in the early church is that this abstraction removes him from his materiality and his Jewishness and the essentialization of Christian theology uh, tells the heavenly movements of Jesus without the dirt under his, under his fingernails, right? Born of a, conceived of a virgin, born of Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, you get that, and then sometimes to send to hell, and then raised on the third day, and everything else is Trinity and resurrection and all that kind of stuff. What gets cut out is the whole content of all the Gospels, what Jesus said, did, and endured, the way that he uh, insisted and established divine solidarity with the underside and the oppressed. So this move of domination systems in any uh, narrative that they want to harness the allegiance to it for their own means as they abstract it from the material conditions. They essentialize it, say, in uh, authoritative tellings that don't remind you that God takes sides. 
and then go, this is theology. And I think for me, when I met James Cone, I met him through uh, James Evans, who his book, We Have Been Believers. Oh. Uh, and then I went and read James Cone after that. I go home because I was in school, tell my dad, and my dad goes, James Cone, you know, the first thing was that I ever wrote that was published in an academic journal was my was a book review of Martin and Malcolm. And then I got the book really? and read I didn't it. know that. First, my, I didn't know you knew James Evans like that. I didn't know you knew James Evans that well. Uh, he was my president at Colgate Rochester Divinity School. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah so I was assigned um, the uh, uh, We Have Been Believers and wow. Uh, wow. in theology, the first theology class I had. And it was a good, and you know he's draw and he's dealing with some of the tensions between black theology and the black church and dealing with African American theology. That's, that's a very underappreciated text. I've Under, I've taught it a few times when I've taught systematic because it's one of the it's one of the only systematic black theological texts outside of James Cone. Mm-hmm. Most most people have not written most black theologians have not written systematic theology. That's a very systematic text. And he really does weave in the kind of the black experience and kind of this, the Christian narrative. So he'll go to folk tales, mm-hmm. um, African stories, as well as the Hebrew writings. I mean, it's a very interesting way to think about theology. Yeah. And, and it was reading that where it then led me back to Cone. And then I found out my dad did, a, uh, he's like, the first thing I had published was my review of, a Martin and Malcolm when he was uh, doing his doctorate at Drew. So, um, wow. The uh, uh, it it in my it, why why I found Cone so uh, disturbing as someone who was blessed by be, I, my in my context my family were the edgy Christians. Um, mm-hmm. Was it? Even there in the South, I was a Baptist preacher's kid in rural North Carolina. Right when it goes to questions of race, uh, it was all under the reconciliation uh, yeah. structure. Um, yeah. and, and this led my dad did an interracial wedding. The KKK burned a cross in front of the church. Right, so like in my mind, I'm like, we're the edgiest as it gets. And then James Cone was like, "All right, hold it, trip." <laughs> and 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 I remember that moment getting so uncomfortable that uh that that I didn't finish the book. And it wasn't until like three or four months later when I read John Sabrino's Jesus the Liberator. Mm, mm. And for some reason, because he was giving shit to the Roman Catholic Church mm, and big systems that I listened. And I was like, mm. you're right. You're right, Sabrino. Mm. And then I was talking with uh, a friend of mine who's an African-American Disciples of Christ minister uh, in uh, in North Carolina. And, and he was like, you dropped Cone, but you finished Sabrino? And I was like, yeah. He goes, you're going to need to pray about that. And, and, I, and I say that just but knowing that there are lots, uh, there are lots of uh, – in the article we read today of James Cone, right? Like part of what he's getting at and around white silence is just how uncomfortable it is when you know that the correct description of the gospel, if you take seriously the embedded material conditions of Jesus and the material conditions of our world means that you now have to cultivate a hermeneutic for looking at your privilege your normal, what you saw as reality that makes you as suspicious of your cherished identity as a self, as a white Christian in the South, as an American in the globe, as a hardworking meritocratist, like capitalist, like the hermeneutics of suspicion that are cultivated when you realize God takes sides in that domination systems maneuver of abstracting and then essentializing the abstraction so that then when you read scripture, what do you go? Um, Look for how it accounts for the inner workings of the Trinity. Not that Jesus literally said, today, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. This is a 
Luke 4 shout out. Or like you read Matthew 25 and you're like, yeah, well, um, the or, or you like read Exodus and God's like, let my people go. And you're like, perhaps, but have you considered how influential we could be if we all laid hands around Donald Trump and prayed? Right? Like the the like one of the reasons theology matters is that if you give yourself to a, a Christian account of the gospel that's abstracted from the mere material conditions and then essentialize something that's divorced from it, you end up with one that is colorblind and a colorblind theology can't be, it ends up being anti-Semitic when you deal with Jesus and it ends up being uh, racist when you look at our contemporary context. And I just know that I could make those observations when reading John Sabrino, Gutierrez, and plenty of other liberation theologians. But it was James Cone that made me so uncomfortable, you know, when in my early 20s, reading theology through all these important figures for the first time that made me realize uh, what happens when part of your cherished self-image, the story you tell yourself about how you're the good guy gets called into question. Absolutely. And it's yeah. not easy, right? It's just not easy if you're me doing that. And I feel like I, I was celebrated by my family and my church if I brought that kind of stuff up and were uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? I'm not mm-hmm. in a context like a lot of people that I talk to who, you know, maybe if their family and friends found out they signed up for this, they'd be like, that's like the gateway to socialism. Um and it, 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 so, so, but maybe you can say, it, tell me what you think about that. That like part of the first theme on theology matters is that theology, if we abstract it and then essentialize it, what ultimately gets locked in place is the silent but essentialized power structure that's now no longer questioned because it's removed from the material conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first, the idea of theology matters comes from the idea of uh, any of us who are teachers realize that if you're talking to this generation of students, is you have to justify the theology isn't just a given that people can say, hey, this works. Like, you know, if people major in theology, there's not jobs that usually say, hey, we want someone with a theology degree, right? So how do you justify that it's significant? It's also kind of a rhetorical phrase off of Cornell West books, race matters, right? And he had a series of essays about the significance of race. Well, we have to do something similar in the 21st century about theology, especially for progressives, right? Because theology or to be Christian is to take the opposite side of many progressive issues, right? The opposite side of the abortion or the same-sex marriage, right? That that the defining identity of what it means to be Christian. So theology matters in order to kind of preserve the who Jesus is versus the 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 the, the religion the the Constantinian theology that gets so promoted in the context of America, right? So how do you actually preserve a under deep and abiding sense of faith in a context? where Caesar and Constantine define the very substance of the dominant culture's religion, right? So it's a way of trying to talk to get to that, that kind of prophetic voice of Jesus in solidarity with the, with the underclass and yeah. talking about a dangerous form of loving, a subversive and disruptive form of loving. It disrupts from systems of hate, systems of shame, systems of anxiety, Right. It really tries to affirm a new way of being, a new way of being human in the context of a many labored web of oppression. Right. So it's about a new mode of humanity. Right. Christianity is trying to introduce that. So theology matters because it's about a new orientation to our humanity. And it's not just about a certain study of a institutional religion 
but it gets to the deeper core, like you talked about how you were constituted around these kind of racial, um, uh, I guess, ideas, and you had to unlearn, right, in order to learn. So the process becomes, we have to unlearn a lot of that kind of stuff in order to be rebirthed into something new. Mm -hmm. it, I love how you emphasize the, you use the adjective like new repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that shows up in kind of the radical newness throughout Paul's epistles is that uh, after the new creation or the new humanity, then you ha you're in a perspective to see the old. Right. And it involves drawing a distinction. And one of the kind of problems of culture dominant Christianity is it leads with, let me tell you about the old so you can find yourself in it to know you're wrong. Um, and now that you know you're wrong, I can get, I can sell you <laughs> what's good. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. and, and one of the things that, uh, it, uh, okay, for, at least for me, one of the things that, initially comes across as abrasive about Cohn's uh, kind of rhetorical skills and commitment to liberation is if you're sitting there trying to negotiate where you want to locate yourself, it feels offensive, but it's not mm. because he's sitting there just trying to attack you. It's because mm. he's actually telling you the sheer joy and love that comes out of a world mm -hmm. where your identity is not locked into these binaries of oppressor and oppressed um, mm. and, and such. And so part of the genius, I think, of what Cohn invites us to do is to draw the right distinctions. And you yes. draw the distinctions from where God has promised to be and where we're going and not necessarily from where we're where we've been. Because when it's drawn mm -hmm. from where we've been, the di the distinctions are built on um, uh, on an inheritance of perversity and inequality. When you draw the distinction on where you're going, then the question is, where are you being faithful and showing up in the present? And yeah, it absolutely. really took uh, for me, and and I mean, this is probably the third or fourth time I've read this article we read of Cones today. I, I heard it real different today. And I wondered, that was my response today differently than before was that, that he actually is doing this shift that Paul does that a lot of people miss is that I'm going to tell you the new and in whatever parts of you that go, yes, lean into that and trust that then talk about what's old. I'm not going to just like talk shit about the old the whole time and hope to guilt you into the right thing. Yeah, no, that, that's beautiful. Uh, well, well, what I liked also about what you said is that the idea that Cone is an invitation, right? It's an invitation to think and live differently. And what most people miss when they read Black theology and why it takes a few readings for some people is the metaphor that Black and whiteness are metaphors. They're not talking about skin color, right? They're metaphors about how skin color is more than skin color, that race has a significance beyond skin color in the context of the modern West. Right. So that whiteness is symbolic, just like, you know, the idea of Jesus as a lily or Jesus as a lamb, the lamb of God, not literally a lamb. Right. But you're trying to talk about a metaphor for how Jesus is. Well, the same way whiteness and blackness is not talking about literal whiteness and blackness. You're talking about a metaphor. Right. So he's trying to use whiteness and blackness, because even in his first text, Black Theology, Black Power, he says there are some black people whose hearts and souls are lily white. He says there are some white people who identify so completely with blackness. Right. Even Malcolm X, when they asked him for a good white person, he said John Brown. Right. Um, so the, the point being is blackness, the, the blackness and whiteness have never been these type of totalitizing, excuse me, um, ideas about racial in the sense of skin color. They've been metaphors to really talk about the location of power, privilege, and advantage versus the deprivation of that, mm -hmm. right? 
So the invitation in the context of American empire is to be counter imperial, right? To really detach your heart and soul from the mechanisms of empire and put it back into the work of God as active in the people, right? And that's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing for black middle class people, especially ones that got cushy jobs and higher degrees, right? That's not, yeah. that's not where the movement of Jesus are, the creative movement of Jesus is. They don't lead that movement. Mm -hmm. We have to be in solidarity with that. Yeah, and, right? and so, last time, la the last time we did this class, uh, one of the videos was uh, that that uh, we shared was the, okay, maybe it was, but I've watched this YouTube video where Cone and Cornell West are talking and yes. Cornell West makes the point you're just making about Barack Obama and kind of looks back at Cone and goes, and Cone goes, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I think that there is that, uh, a titch okay. Um, one of the things I meant to bring up earlier, I just looked at my notes and see I completely miss this. It, uh, what if you know almost no history going into this mm. conversation? And mm. yeah, at, when you read the Hopkins article, um, I mean, it gives a big history. I think a lot of people, especially because of the work of the 1619 Project, are more aware of the bigger history. But for understanding Cone, um, he brings out tensions between the civil rights movement and the black power movement. Uh, and Cone is an inheritor of both of them. So for, for those that either weren't attentive or were in a, in a school in the South that avoids uh, any history classes getting to any time African-Americans had the right to vote um, or, uh, uh, or just really young and are like, the 60s and 70s, I don't remember that. Uh, I wasn't around at all. So so when we're trying to understand Cone and where he's formed in the, the black church and the black power movement, the civil rights movement, and then uh, you know, like the black power movement and Malcolm X and such, uh, uh, how should we understand that historical moment and how it shapes his his theological project. Yeah, that's important. I mean, I would argue that they do understand history. They have a mythological history, right? Because even though the seventies might seem older, Jesus is older than the seventies, right? Uh, George Washington. Adam, he's alive in my heart right now. Older. So he's still here. <laughs> George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are older than the sixties and seventies, right? So they do know history is so what they say that they have a they have a certain type of um, exclusionary vision of history, right? Um, and that's the whole point. And what black culture and history does, it functions in American culture in what Metz calls a dangerous memory, right? It's a dangerous memory of freedom, right? The same thing, the way the memory of Jesus is a dangerous memory. Um, a memory that is disruptive and points to a new way of being. And that's where the convergence happens, right? So part of it is like, yeah, part of what social control and oppression does, it gives you a false memory, a memory of dominance, a victor's memory. But when you remember from the underside, right? It be, and you evoke that memory, it becomes dangerous and it becomes threatening. And that's why there's so much resistance actually that occurs is because that people see this memory as, a, as something to stamp out and not to embrace, right? So I would say that if they don't know, they should be open to trying to hear a new voice and see themselves. It's like when people read the gospel of Jesus, they always want to see themselves as being with Jesus, but they need to see themselves as the Romans, right? Because Americans are more like the Romans than they are like the Nazareans, right? So locate yourself properly 
and see that because it depends because you have to do a different type of internal work. Black middle class people have to do an internal work to get with Cone, right? So certainly white middle class people have to do an internal work to get with Cone, right? Because he points us a, a point in orientation that's outside of both of us, that's in the people who are struggling to be oppressed and to, and to, to be free from the bonds of oppression, the working class folks that are struggling to be free. And that working class movement is, is where he sees on the margins of the margins, right? Is where our heart and soul needs to be. And it doesn't mean we necessarily have to be activists or protesters, but it means that we have to be in solidarity with that and use our skill where we are to bring voice to those who are voiceless. Mm -hmm. And, and the, like, how would you, how would you describe the kind of connections and the dissimilarities uh, between like Martin and Malcolm and kind of the nonviolent kind of depiction of uh, of Martin that we get uh, it today and Grant, everyone should go listen to a couple of years ago. Adam did a talk. It's on the podcast. I'll link it on the dangerous uh, uh, MLK. Um, but let's assume the dangerous one. Like, what are the contrasts that uh, Martin and Malcolm bring up for Cone that get explored through theologically through his work in thinking about um, the the invitation to, to kind of faithful discipleship in the present? Wow. Uh, that, that is such a great um, that's such a great question. Um, well, first, um, I would first point people to James Cone's book, Martin, Malcolm in America, just for people who may not be familiar with that text, because he does like a whole reading on the relationship between Martin and Malcolm, right? So we first want to say that both of them are committed to black freedom, right? As an overarching thing, but they represent two different trajectories in the struggle. Martin was more the inclusionist phase who had a Christian identity. Malcolm was the black nationalist phase. So there's two different strains of black, there's, a, there's, a, there's basically the civil rights phase of the black freedom movement that started from 1956 and ends in like 19, about 66. And 56, I'm marking it with Montgomery bus boycott, and I'm ending it with the rise of black power through Stokey Carmichael in 1966 and 1966 to about 1972. Um, what black, the what the civil rights movement did, it gave a new understanding of Christian identity itself. Right. Like, for example, in the context of Birmingham, the letter from the Birmingham jail was written to other Christian clergy who were pro segregation. At the time that King was alive and doing movements in the South, the dominant Christian personality was who? Billy Graham doing Christian crusades in the segregated South, never mentioning. Right. Segregation, the evils of segregation. And people judge King as not a minister, as a shyster, because he wasn't about saving souls, right? He wasn't bringing people to Jesus. He was about this protest. He was getting arrested by the police. To be a minister in the context of the South in the 1950s and 60s was to follow the law, right? To be a good citizen and to bring people to Jesus through a personal relationship. And King said to define Christianity as a struggle against moral evil, right? That was a different type of context, all right? So the, in the context of, of, of the civil rights movement, the very paradigm of what it meant to be Christian shifted. It shifted from this idea of this elevator theology of trying to get to heaven to, a, to the idea of trying to eradicate 
evil on earth, moral evil and suffering on earth. So Christianity became much more um, as a address to the question of suffering than, than the idea of philosophy aggressive, uh, as a address to the question of truth, right? You could talk about truth, but truth is in relationship to suffering, immoral evil. That's when truth, beauty, goodness become real, right? So there's a new Christian paradigm in the context of civil rights movement. For the black power phase, right? It was a radical rejection of Christianity. For those of you who are familiar with radical theology, it was the death of God phase. The Christian God died. It was a kind of uh, cultural atheism. Why? Because black people have been Christian for hundreds of years in this country. And the, the prospect of freedom was more remote then than it had, had been 100 years before. So people like Malcolm would look at King and say, King, how can you use the religion of your oppressor to free the oppressed? Even if you look at Gandhi, Gandhi wasn't a Christian. He didn't acculturate the British religion. He was always a Hindu. So he fought as a Hindu against Christians. Malcolm thought it was morally absurd to adopt the religion of your oppressor, right? So he called Christianity a white man's religion. And the idea, uh, and, and before Malcolm, black people referred to themselves as Negroes. It wasn't until Malcolm that he made black cool. And blackness was not just a semantic change. It was a way of reconceptualize a human identity. Negro was seen as being deferential to whiteness. Blackness was seen as a way of self-assertion and self-determination. So the, what, what, how that impacted Cone was that Cone went from being a Negro theologian to a Black theologian but didn't know what it meant to be black and do theology. Therefore, the first question he had was, what does it mean to be black and Christian? It was clear what it meant to be Negro and Christian. It was unclear what, to meant to, what it meant to be black and Christian, because you're talking about a new cultural identity and orientation, and Christianity was seen as suppressing that. So you can either reject that or you can reconstruct that, right? So in a strange way, you can understand it as a new type of theodicy, right? If God is all good and all powerful, then why are black people so low and white folks so high? Yeah. Right? It, How can you answer that as a black person in the context of the United States and still believe that God is all good? There's a good God. If all you see is wretchedness around you and the people who treat you mean are prospering, mm -hmm. right? You must not be calling the right God because something's got to be wrong because there's no way God could ordain your degradation this way. Yeah. So that's what Cohn sought out to um, kind of reconstruct. So like in that moment around how Cohn inherits those traditions and rephrases the theodicy question, um, not that we have to dwell on this, but just as someone who theodicy was a big deal for them, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. how you end up being part of the hashtag process party. Um, yeah. uh, it is... Uh, White theologians are more likely to explain Auschwitz mm. or how God mm. is still good in the face of natural evil and the death rate of evolution than mm. a white American Christian explaining white supremacy. And so Absolutely. I, and Cohn emphasizes this in the white silence thing article we read and I just think it's 
I just think it's really, really true. Uh, uh, um, I don't know if it was in this article. It's in, I, but I think we're reading it, uh, thinking back to my notes. But at some point, he makes an observation. Uh, it, it, this is Trip performing it, so I don't. It would not be probably this tame, but something like, "Why theologians will do a whole class explaining to the non-believer how they could still believe in a good God." But they won't do one sentence to explain to the non-person in their own country why they should. And that's yeah. because it cost them something. Right. And so I I like how would you describe that shift from think Tillich's theology of culture, the non-believer, existential existentialism, kind of into the 20th century stuff, to a bourgeois reflections to the non-person. And you're taking the same question the tradition has always asked, right? If you're a monotheist that believes God's good and loving and just, and then you look at the world and go, WTF, right? That's the odyssey. You ask that question. But the, what's interesting is what makes you look at the world and go, WTF? Is it yeah. a lot of things yeah. went extinct in evolution? Is it right. that the domination system of Europe that had multiple world wars is acting a fool? Yeah. Or how is it the fact that you're interpreted and defined? Yeah. So so Yeah, how's evil be interpreted and divide? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's what that that's the whole article. I mean, like, look, after after the Holocaust, Jew, Jewish theologians said that all theology, all God talk must meet the test of Auschwitz. Right? That no statement theological or otherwise should be credible that wouldn't be credible in the presence of burning children, right? No theological statement should be seen as credible that's not credible in the context of burning children. That's a heavy thing to say. Cole takes that tack, right? It says that no theological statement should be credible that's not credible in the, in, in the presence of suffering Black folk, right? That's all God talk has to meet the test of Black suffering. So that's a new moral criteria that he makes that parallels the way Jewish theologians were thinking of a kind of post-Holocaust theology. And this is why justice was framed right? Um, the way the Jewish theologian said, we can't give Hitler a post-humanist victory. Well, Black Cohn didn't want to give white supremacy <laughs> a victory in the context of constructive theology. That's why he said race must be the asset test of an American theology, right? And I want to be con uh, clear that Cohen, when he talked about blackness and whiteness, he was talking about the North American context. He said, conceivably, and this is where he, you know, his dialogue with theologians around the world, um, that blackness and whiteness might not be the, the, the precise metaphor to talk about suffering and liberation in the context of other societies. Uh, if you're in India, you might talk about the Dalis. If you're a Korean, you might talk about something different, right? So he didn't want to universalize that and say it's once and for all, but he thought the relationship between suffering and oppression is universal, but the language and the categories you use might be context specific. And that's really important to understand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, I know you know this, but just to emphasize for people that don't, part of this is part of the influence of Bart on him, Karl Bart, right? Like in yeah. the 20th century, um, the one of the biggest critiques to religion was uh, this is Fowerbuck, but was hey, y'all call it religion, I call it projection. You project on a wall what you'd like to kill for and love for, and then you're like, it's not my fault, God did it, you know. And uh, how how are you ever supposed to tell me any of these, um? these ideas you have around about God are even really about God. And Karl Barth shows up and goes, yeah, human beings are idol factories because I'm reformed tradition. Calvin says that. And so if we're going to talk about God, it has to be God telling us who God is. 
-hmm. And when God told us who God was, it found flesh. And it was a homeless first century Jew. It was executed by the empire. And, and, you know, and like, and Cone's like going, thanks, Carl. You know, um, now I just want to make a small observation. <laughs> you know, yeah, dear yeah, Americans yeah. that are quoting Carl Bart at me and, you know, people that are in my school, like Niebuhr and all this kind of stuff. Like, have y'all considered the fact that um, there's a correlation? I know y'all like correlation to Lickians. Uh, it's a fancy word for your theological methodology. There's a correlation between the cross and the lynching tree. So let's just pause there and go, if you're only allowed to talk about God, when God tells you who God is, and when God told us who God was in the advent of Christ, it meant the world said cross. And then you abstract it so much that you get to say cross slash lynching tree in the present and never talk about it as a theologian. What you're silencing by uh, ignoring white supremacy, systemic racism, violence against black bodies, isn't like my pet issue as a black theologian. What you're sidestepping is God's self-testimony that God has chose the underside in all situations, right? And so he's developing out of America in what you're saying there from his engagement in around religious pluralism is he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to know what is the point? In North America, I use black and white. But that's because what's normative is that the incarnation was on the underside. The incarnation. The only reason we get to talk about God is because God tells us who God is, right? And so uh, that's why in some people go, oh, he's a liberation theologian in scare quotes. And then <laughs> and James is like going, yeah, because God is a liberation God. It's not like this is an elective. It's not like God's hobby. I did my core classes called the Trinity. And then I was like, what do you want to do after lunch before you go home? Maybe liberation or maybe aesthetics. You know, it's just not how it is. Like you got Moses says to Pharaoh, get out. And then God raises Jesus from the dead to say, tell Caesar didn't work. And then you, so it it is that the like the notion of revelation that he's inheriting right from post-World War II, uh, like, uh, context in Europe that was then inspired by the theology of crisis, like Bart, then gets picked up, put in American context, and the very theologians footnoting them in one context are then ignoring the historical context in America. Yeah. But it's God's self-identity. Go and, and saying that liberation is not just, it's not just liberation theology that li Liberation is a synonym yeah. theology, right? It's not, it's not an adjective. It's a synonym. So therefore, the way process might talk about creative advance or creativity, that's what liberation is in the context. That's how it functions in the context of liberation's framework. It's the very essence of how one talks about God, right? Like how God's activity functions in the world. So therefore, the metaphor for Cohen is working against racial injustice. But liberation, the metaphor, you need to be liberated from anxiety. You need to be liberated from anger. You need to be liberated from, from shame, from humiliation. Like the metaphor of liberation, as all ways of speaking about God, can be applicable for all different types of things and not, and, and racial injustice could be the key metaphor, but we have to expand that now. Um, to other forms of bondages. So that's, that's the way it functions. And I'm glad you mentioned that because what happens a lot of times for people who cannot hear through the racial idiom, they can't hear the deep theology, theological reasoning. So they read black theology as race talk. Matter of fact, in the first couple books, they didn't even call it theology. They called it like black studies or sociology. It didn't even have that as an identifier on the book, Theology. So they put it, you know how like, um, you may not, most people may not know, is that when you have a book, um, you go into a Barnes and Noble or a physical book, a, a, a bookstore or a library, how they catalog, catalog the book says a lot about what they think the content is. And oftentimes black theology wasn't cataloged with in the theology section. It was either in the Black History, Black Studies, or Sociology section, right? 
So they couldn't hear the type of theological argument. And Cohn at his core is a theological figure um, that uses race, not a race thinker that uses theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and, um, if, uh, uh, if this were a graduate seminar, the, I find Cohn's bringing together the black experience, desire for liberation and God's commitment to liberation. Uh, then utilize how he utilizes Tillich's correlation and Bart's uh, kind of self-testimony methodology is rather brilliant. Uh, and like the idea that even if you like completely disagreed with his agenda, it gets problematized because it's such good theology. Um, it, it's uh, the the second half of the twentieth century is a whole bunch of people figuring out how you figure out what to do with Barton Tillich, and the fact that uh, he gives a robust, thick, rich account of the faith, and what is it that he introduces that makes those intuitions sing, and harmonize, and 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 relate to each other in ways that neither one of them could have anticipated. It's precisely the recognition that the life of the people on the underside is the very place you find God. Right? It's what Euro theology, when it's abstracted, essentialized, and called just theology, completely is missed. He reintroduces that and then points out the failings that both of those kind of uh, theological systems had uh, 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 kind of missed in uh, rather brilliant ways. Um, and then – creates uh, individuals who will end up reading, who then take the questions of theology, having been inspired by Cone, and then rephrase them. So like when we read uh, Dolores Williams, uh, atonement gets rephrased in a different way. Um, anyway. Right. But, but for those who are theological thinkers already on the podcast, here's the key difference I want, distinction I want to make between Cone and Tillich and, and, and uh, Bart, is that Tillich and Bart came from dominant cultures, right? So part of their challenge was to try to separate Christian revelation from from the cultures of dominance, right? Because they didn't want to see it as identical. So they worked hard to do that. But when you work from a suppressed culture, right, it, it is more advantageous to see God working within the culture itself, not as distinct from but within that emerges from the culture. So Cone wanted to, f- to find how God's activity in the context of black culture, black history, not completely distinct from, and that had to do a lot with social location, right? And how he yeah. read the Bible. So that would be a w- one key distinction, although he did have a, um, um, he actually did his dissertation for those who don't know on Karl Barth, right? So he was deeply influenced, especially his early work. But he later broke significantly, and if you read his work, he'll talk about the ways in which he breaks from Bart. Mm-hmm. And 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 in America, he, like Niebuhr, he had like this ongoing love hate relationship with Niebuhr, uh, Reinhold mm-hmm. Niebuhr. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the things you see in the uh, the like the White Silence audience or, or, or the White Silence article is that he basically asked Niebuhr to do what he said he was going to do. Right. So like he points out places Niebuhr makes observations and then go, well, if you think this and you're in America, huh? Right. And and I and I think that's important. And maybe if you don't know who Reinhold Niebuhr is and the role he was playing in the academy and the church at that point, it may not you may not understand what's going on. But what Cohn's trying to point out is that the leading public theologian of the day who politicians, church leaders alike the one Christian Century and Time Magazine plaster on their cover about like the one that's figured it out. He's like, I want to agree with him. Look at this high quality material he's got right here. Now, I don't couldn't tell it was happening in America because there was some stuff muted in the examples. <laughs> you know, like the in in I think what he's trying to get at is to point at you could have encountered. Uh, intellectually coherent, even a beautiful, impactful encounter with God in Christ 
in the church, in all these things. It could animate you. It could even inspire your imagination. But until you actually open up your theological imagination to the whole embodied web of relations you have in the world, then it could actually be silent and muted on in places where God is deeply invested. And, and that runs through when you look at the reasons for white silence in the article, um, uh, this is my summary of them. And then you can say whatever you want, just because I realize we've been talking for a while. Is it yeah. why don't why don't have to talk about racism? So they don't, right? So insert Niebuhr or anyone gives it great examples of all sorts of stuff, but sidesteps the like the one at home. Uh, why <laughs> avoid race talk? Because they feel guilt. And yeah, once you absolutely. feel guilt, what do you do? Yeah, you get four reasons for that, yeah. Because guilt involves responsibility. Once you have guilt, you have to wrestle with it. Are you responsible uh, because you've internalized shame and oppression, right? Because that's something he emphasizes, uh, that uh, the self-hate concept that uh, Malcolm mm -hmm. uh, taught blacks have internalized it. Or is the guilt from, like, genuine benefit from oppression and harm? Uh, that why don't talk about race because they can't handle black rage, and you've mentioned that uh, already. Um, and the, and the other example he gave, uh, or fourth reason was whites are not prepared for racial redistribution of power and wealth. That w if you admit yeah. it, it might cost you something, right? And mm -hmm. when he mentions that, one of the questions that came in, and one. Uh, element that showed up in both the Hopkins article and in Cohn's and is funding the anxiety that Serene's pointing out in hers is it depending on where you were in history the desire moved from kind of the black nationalist separationist black power type thing to and this swing towards integration and equality and equity type thing um and and then since uh you know in the last seven or eight years there's been the re, re kind of like a new energy around thinking about reparations and such um from barack obama's election and on and like you start to there's always this negotiation of of the relationship to the american ideal and vision and then the christian vision uh, get, for those that are that may not understand the swing, how would you typify it? And then how is it being? What is that? How does that swing between kind of separation to reparation for full engagement today? How how do you see that in the present? Wow, well, you, you just said a lot. Let, let me go back a little bit to Diva because I, I want to give some context to, um, first of all, for those who are interested in pursuing Cohn's thoughts on Niebuhr, uh, it's chapter two of The Cross of the Lynching Tree. Mm -hmm. He gives a full, you know, throated account of both Niebuhr's limitations on race and his his powerful insights. Uh, he, he thought that Abraham Joshua Heschel had a better kind of take on race, who was a contemporary of Niebuhr. Um, but and also because of his Jewish and fleeing the Holocaust, he had this kind of more identif identification. But one thing that you know, I want to just tell our, our viewers that Cohn's editor Robert Elsner um, shared with us in, in, in one of the videos you'll be you'll be featuring is that he he actually uh, was the editor for the Crossley and Lynchy Tree, and he tried to take the Niebuhr chapter out. He suggested that, and Cohen insisted on that stay. Right. Because he looked at it and it was all about, you know, if you look at the cross, when you read the cross of the lynching tree, you'll see that Cohen is interpreting um, black life in a lot of different ways. Niebuhr is the only white theologian he deals with. And he said, how can you deal with all this kind of black interpretation? And Niebuhr just seemed out of sorts. So he him as a white male tried to get it, take it out. And, and Cohn just fought and insisted and it turned out that Cohen is right because more people look at that particular thing than almost, I won't say that anything else, but that became a really significant um, chapter, chapter two of the crossing the lynching tree, right? So I wanted to just kind of point people in, in that direction. 
Also, when you talked about um, what we read for this week about why white scholars don't talk enough about race and religion, um, and this gets back to, to your last point, it's about power for Cohn. Cohn says the quality of white life is hardly ever affected by what blacks think or do. The reverse is not the case. So everything whites think and do impacts blacks profoundly, right? So whites don't have to think about race because their lives are not affected by, by it until there's an uprising, right? And that's why you have all these protests and uprising is because if we're not going, we're going to make you uncomfortable because we live uncomfortable every day, right? That's the whole object of these kind of disruptive protests is to make you feel as uncomfortable as we normally are in order to get you think differently about this issue, right? That's the whole objective of a protest, right? And then they avoid because of guilt, as, as Tripp just said, because whites don't want to think of themselves as evil, right? They don't want to think of themselves as evil people and that they place colonization um, of, the, of the Indian man, enslavement of the African, exploitation of people of color, Whites see themselves as kind of hardworking and fair-minded, right? So the idea of being the source of slavery, right, or uh, the perpetuators of slavery and about colonialism makes them uncomfortable. How do you deal with that history, right? So to actually think about race is to face that history. It's also hard to face history of be labeled as thieves, murderers, labeled or racist. Uh, they don't think they owe black people anything because they haven't personally enslaved, lynched, or segregated anyone. They feel like they've treated everybody alike, right? But what Cohn would argue, and most people do argue, uh, most black intellectuals argue, that if you benefit from the past and its present injustice against blacks, you are partly and indirectly accountable as a citizen and a member of institutions that perpetuate racism, right? So you don't necessarily have to be personally have racial animus to be a beneficiary of it and to participate in a system that oppresses, right? And then the idea that blacks, you know, whites don't want to engage black rage, which I mentioned. They don't mind talking to blacks as long as you don't get too carried away or emotional about the stories of hurt. So what Cohn does, he asks black whites to imaginatively enter into the world of black suffering, right? 246 years of slavery, 100 years of lynching and segregation, 1 million people incarcerated, 13% of the drug use, but 74% of the prison population, New Jim Crow. And if your son gets shot dead by police because of their color, you become the suspect, right? So enter into that world, right? So what, what Cohn really tries, you mentions is that, that to actually enter into, uh, that, that these are some of the primary reasons why race is actually avoided by, by, by whites primarily. Now, to, to, to update your question, <laughs> actually, to to talk about um, well, re reframe it, reframe the, the, the well, very end of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. My uh, my attempt to be brief is always one thing. Um, <laughs> but what really was how, how has over the history of Cohn's career, and then thinking about inheriting it today, how has the vision for the promise of America changed? Because in both um, his article and in um, <clears throat> the Hopkins Dwight Hopkins article, it seems like there has been a a, a pendulum swing between thinking, um, like if right, the theological norm is integrative liberation, um, including affirmation of self identity, self determination for the black people, and that the God of liberation is dwelling with and acting for the poor, then what would that look like? Sometimes in America seems that it swings towards uh, uh, separation um, uh, in this kind of robust black uh, uh, power style move to then 
sometimes to kind of uh, kind of deep uh, integration where the harms and injustice of the past involve um, uh, not just recognition, uh, but reparations. Right. Where uh, and and it it seems like there's all this move back and forth because Hopkins points out after World War Two, you have these two big variables. Um, black soldiers come back to America and go, oh, junk. Jim Crow's not in France. You know, um, that's just not how it is there. We liberate them. They were clapping for me just like the, the white guy next to me. And I come back here and we go back into this world. Right. And yeah. there's that tension. And then you get the also the after World War Two, all of a sudden, because of all the destruction, the rest of the world and the way multinational companies uh, leverage the destruction of the rest of the world and uh, labor and raw resource, raw materials. We have this booming economy and everyone's doing better. And so then he says, like, even right, the working class, poor families, real, uh, black families go, our children will do better if we all commit to this system. Oh, we get voting rights. Oh, this kind of thing. Uh, and then the vision is like, can we have an inheritance of the past that then deals with the injustice? And it seems like there's this this uh, pendulum. Uh, the Dwight's articles, uh, I think it was published like you know right as Obama's coming in. Um, uh, and and last time he was on the podcast was then as well. So like thinking about what is the situation today, uh, and yeah, and I what's going you. on in those two that kind of like movement. All right, look for those who are interested in that question, I would recommend Jennifer Harvey's book called Dear White Queer Christians. Right. For those, it's, it's called Dear White Christian, for those still longing for racial reconciliation. Because what she does is she's informed by Cone's work, and that's why I want to say this, um, is she talks about, most of y'all, especially if you're evangelicals, hear the term racial reconciliation, which has been a big popular term for the last two decades. What she says is that white Christians need to move from the framework of reconciliation to the frameworks of reparations. Reparations meaning repair. It's not just about reconciliation. It's about repairing the damage, the moral injury already done and moving into the future. And she talks about that as a different way to try to model what substantive justice looks like. Racial reconciliation might talk about procedural justice Right. So you have different procedures. You have a, you don't have the same barrier this is why the whole critical race theory and everything like that, that those things don't account for power adequately. So even though blacks might have due process, there's still intense racial disparities in terms of outcome. Right. So that even though you might have a jury by your peers and 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 um, certain forms of personal liberties, the disparities are still as wide as ever. And the reason for that is because the power is unaccounted for. The idea of using a paradigm of reparations is that the goal isn't just for procedural justice, it's for substantive justice, right? It's about not just trying to talk about fairness in your personal, it's about repairing the wounds already done. The, the context of this, as I mentioned, um, the German Christians did that for the Jews, right? It wasn't just we have a new procedure and you could be judged. It was about, I need to restore you that what I've taken away. And then, I, so the, first of all, I need to repent, right? If you talk about a Christian position, right? We need to repent for the sins already done, right? Then restore what's been stolen, and then we could talk about the creation of a new society, right? As of now, we just talk about a, 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 a currently oppressive society and how blacks fit in to what already is a disordered house. But reparations talks about we need a reordering as we try to repair and restore. So I think that 
most white Christians are paradigmatically wrong when they talk about the issue of race. They need a new framework and a new paradigm to talk about justice and a new humanity moving forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, So just so everyone, especially if this is your first time on a homebrew class, like tomorrow, the audio and video will show up on the resource page. So you can always go back. And if you are cooking dinner or if you're on the West Coast and you're on your drive home and get home, like you can turn off and join late. Uh, it, that's all good. Um, also, if you're in Scotland and it's midnight, uh, no one's bothering you. Uh, but, but there, I have two and, and if more. you're in a phone booth, I hope the audio is a little bit clearer because I'm jumping back and forth. And I have all this type of things. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, so I, I hope to. Clear. I have two more. Um, uh, two more questions. Uh, one and um, and they bring together things people have commented on in the different places. And one, there are two different comments. They're both about black rage. Mm. Uh, so uh, this is a DM. But could you ask Adam what black rage sounds like? Because I don't know if I have a black friend that would trust me to hear it. And I, and I, and, and, and I said, I, that's a vulnerable question to ask for anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that why you ask that, not because it doesn't exist like on the internet, but I think that reveals to us some ways in which we all know in media there's always a performative aspect. Mm. And so how does the, or how does it, how, how does uh rage get expressed when it's not as a public, you know, as a public intellectual or, you know, let's say we're in the Academy and we're like doing papers, trying to, you know, wrestle with it and all that kind of thing. Um, but if part of the hesitation around race is being uncomfortable uh, for white c- clergy and theologians at being present for rage, then I think it seems like it's an important thing to figure out. Um, and I say that as someone who knows it uh, just because of my partner, that's also something if you're trying to not inherit patriarchy and the assumptions that you're dealing with that uh, sometimes you just have to be uncomfortable when it's pointed out that the, 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 the arrangements of power you thought were normative just aren't. And there are consequences to them that no one told previous generations that taught you them, you know, and, uh, and yet it still is uncomfortable. Um, Not that you have to like, be like, this is what rage sounds like, but like when people are, at like linger over that point that you've made a couple times cone does um like, like any wisdom on cultivating the ears to hear yeah that, that's a that's a that's an interesting type of question um I'm trying to think about i'll go back to what i said before uh, well, you know, it, it here it, it sounds like Isaiah. It sounds like Amos. It sounds like all the Hebrew prophets, right? Um, anger and rage is a mode of connectedness to other, right? It's an inward refusal to accept the things as they exist, and a sign that transformation is required, right? So that it's a way of it's 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 God's no, right? You talked about God's yes, right? So in America, especially bourgeois culture, we have this kind of unconscious belief that ang- anger inhibits or blocks the mystery at all, of all things, right? But anger can be an entry point into that. Right? Because you're hearing God in a different way. So when you hear anger, 
And there's all different types of way here. There's, there's creative anger and there's destructive anger, right? So what I want to posit is that Cohen is talking about a creative anger, right? Not a destructive anger. So I don't want to like equate all types of things, all types of angers as being positive and something good. But there's a certain type of creative anger that comes at the heart that's about God's no, the inability to accept things as they are, a refusal, right? But deep in that refusal is to really affirm that relationality is at the heart of all things. That's what people miss, right? That as King talked, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, right? So how do we undo these racial scripts of domination, right? That's where God's no comes in. And that's where the kind of rage comes in at these scripts of domination that may not necessarily be directed to people personally, but it's about how they're situated in something, right? That may be very impersonal or may exist that you might have been born into that you're not even aware. And what the rage is trying to do is wake us up to a new way. And if you really are a compassionate and loving person, the rage should actually make you listen differently, to hear differently. As, as King talked about, he talked about riots as the language of the unheard, right? That's his famous thing. He said, riots aren't something that are just some type of destruction. It's a language. And I will encourage people to see, hear the language being used, the rage. What's happening at the core? Don't look at just the symptom, but look at the, look at the cause, right? And, and go down to the cause of the rage. And that's what people are trying to express, that they're raging for a reason. And the reason is situated on a response to a deep moral evil, right? And what Cone would have you do is to hear that and form new solidarities with the cause. Even if you can't accept the person, the person can't accept you. The cause is just. And find a way to be in solidarity with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, the last question topic, which I think is real helpful for framing where we go next, um, is a distinction Cone makes and invites us to make in, in America between the Christian faith and white religion. Um, and th- when he's making that distinction, he's also using white there, not in the uh, like skin tone reference, but in the its relation to power reference, right? In the same way that you talked about earlier, that like black does mean black in the normal sense when you use it theologically. Um, white here does too. Um, so when when he insists that one of those distinctions that are important to draw is between the Christian faith and white religion, um, what kind of distinction, like describe that and then how you hear that in the present, because in some of our previous conversations recently, you know, we've, we've kind of like skirted around the edges of what that means for current white evangelical moment, uh, and such, yeah. but how does like this moment, if you take that distinction, uh, sound or, or, or how do you interpret it? Oh man, to me it's easy. I mean, it's so evident in the stop the steal white Christians, stop the steal the Trumpian white Christians, right? Like the fact that the majority of the white evangelical community voted for Trump, and not just voted for Trump, believe that Trump won the election, and will actually pray to God. The, the 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 kind of um, the religious kind of convictions against mask right like you know all of that type of stuff to me is 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 the recirculation of white religion right it's a tribal type of thing the idea of having a patriot church not a citizen church but a patriot church right like to me that's white religion right there that has nothing to do with Christianity. It doesn't even have a scriptural basis to it, 
but it's used to try to um, defend a certain type of cultural positionality in the context of the American landscape. And they use Christian garb or Christian idioms to justify it. But the pre-theological commitment is to a certain form of white power, right? This is for white power or white hierarchy that's trying to be, that's being protected by a certain type of Christian orientation, Christian idiom and language and that type of thing. And that's what Cohen wanted to do. Cohen wanted, wanted to, to challenge people to say, what does that have to do with the religion of Jesus? Right? What does the idea of you talking about an American patriot church or a flag have to do with a first century, century Palestinian Jew? Right? That, that, that's so fantastic. And the fact that people can normalize that as being true Christianity is what disturb, disturbs Cone and why black theology functions as a dangerous memory in the context of the United States that is actually um, trying to open um, the Christian community to new forms of orientation in the context of justice and love. Mm -hmm. you, when you think of like just how out of context things can be received, right? That mm -hmm. um, a an executed peasant becomes a justification for for Christendom is wild. Uh, but the other day on Twitter at one of these uh, uh, MAGA related gatherings. There were a group of people wearing like Jesus plus Trump equals awesome t-shirts, um, <laughs> waving Confederate flags, uh, oh, right. and dancing wildly to rage against the machine. Wow. And so you sit there and you go like, look, we all know that you misunderstood Jesus, but when rage against the machine was screaming, F you, I won't do what you told me. Uh, Zach De La Roach was not referring to the wearing of masks or taking a vaccine. He was <laughs> referring to the prison industrial complex and the way it supports cycles of poverty that in kind of preserves systemic racism that creates anxiety in a culture that then enables them to close themselves off from the way that same economic system imperializes uh, the poor it, Southern uh, nation neighbors. Um, Somehow they got turned into uh, something about masks. And and I was sitting there giggling, you know, and looking at Twitter responses where they're like, whoa, like it, if you just looked at the lyrics, Rage Against the Machine is literally making fun of how kind of conservative Republicans think that they're on the side of good, but they keep taping the, yeah. the KKK position from generation to generation. Yeah. And now they're like singing a rage song, uh, performing a contradiction. And then and you look at the Twitter and I say to myself, that's literally what happens. If you can't make a distinction between the Christian faith and white religion, yeah, is it, yeah, yeah. it's like, you're the guy in the Trump plus Jesus is awesome. T-shirt waving a Confederate flag to, uh, Rage Against the Machines album Evil Empire Hint hint It's not spiritual And it's not about Satan <laughs> You know right, right, right. It, you it's, know, That's you know, why I, theology I, matters Right like If you yes, don't put absolutely. the things together You look a fool And then everyone thinks it's reasonable Because you've just silenced The violence that are entailed In all sorts of relations That you are not acknowledging you know, another way to frame that is to think about what difference does, does Christianity make once you adopt it as an identity, right? Like when I was growing up, to be Christian meant to not cuss, not have sex before marriage, and to maybe not drink, right? Like that, those are markers of faith, right? What, what Cohen wants to do is give different markers. What, what is the mark of faith? For a lot of, especially Southern Christians or evangelical Christians, the marker of faith is republicanism, right? So Cohen wants to say that all of these markers of faith, these are white, this is white religion. The actual marker of faith is a new form of solidarity, 
That should be the marker of faith. So independent of what ethnicity you come out of, it depends on what church you come. There should be certain markers, and those are substantive markers, right, for what he wants to do. So a way, so so how do you distinguish yourself, you know, from other people if you're like a Trumpian evangelical Christian from just other Trump supporters who do the same thing you do? There is no distinction, right? And that's what uh, that's what upset Cone because especially now that they become the definitive uh, public uh, representation of what a, a Christian position is, right? To what, what a Christian politics is, right? And Cohen wanted to have a new paradigm to talk about a Christian orientation and Christian politics has nothing to do with that. A Christian that, as Jim Wallace talks about, that poverty is in the Christian Testament more than gay marriage <laughs> and more, more than abortion, right? So that the injunctions about poverty throughout the Bible are more so why isn't that equally as stressed in Christian markers as these other types of things on the, on the agenda? And that, that's, that's where Cone's, Cone's heart's at. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed this first conversation and I'm looking forward to the others. Um, uh, everyone that's listening live or later is about to also hear your conversation with uh, Serene Jones. Is wow. there, it, because no one like tells everyone when they're interviewing them all the amazing things about the person so they know who, who they are. Is there something you want to give everyone a heads up about, about Serene um, before they you know, interact with that conversation. Yeah, Serene is the first, I believe she's the first woman president of Union Theological Seminary. Um, um, and I believe she started, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but it was, uh, I think it was like the early 2000s, maybe 2005, 2007, ar around that time period. And Cohen is already established, but she talks about Cohen, and I asked her some questions about Cohen. What was it like to have Cone on, you know, on your theological staff when you're the president, right? What was he like as a person? And she goes on and tells a lot of stories about him as a colleague, right? And how warm and how and how she would get all these media calls for him, but he didn't really want to talk to the the press and the New York Times. It was kind of he, he wasn't an ambulance chaser at all. He actually tried to avoid a lot of publicity. Um, so she gives like a kind of intimate personal discussion as Cone as a friend and a colleague and what it was like to work with him um, as an insider, right? So you get a kind of inside perspective of who Cone was and what type of friend and colleague he is. And she gives, you know, and also what was the atmosphere of union as he worked? So she could kind of do more of a 21st century cone. There are some people who I interviewed who could give a 1970s picture of cone, and others an 80s, and others a 90s picture. So I wanted to get a, a sense of cone since he spent four decades at the same institution, is what was he like as a colleague? What were some of the things that influenced his thought? And also, what was his cone's character like? Give us some insights of what he was as a human being. and. Serene does an excellent job of trying to convey that. Yeah. Oh, I think it's great. I just want everyone that's listening to know how lucky you are to be at the Adam did all these and how like this is going to completely level up your experience of like reading cone. People have been influenced by him, us discussing it and stuff, interacting with people about it. But then like multiple interviews with the people that knew him, like it's, uh, Rather amazing, and I'm pretty sure you'd have to go to Union to have a black theology class that will have the kind of access that all of you are having. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point, Trip. Right. This is very insider access. I don't know yeah. if everybody will get that, but we're, but we're giving it to the public at large, so you get a real special privilege here. So stay tuned and, and pay attention all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we will – 
we'll see you all here live next week tomorrow um which well later this morning if you're in scotland because it's 12 25 a.m um you when i wake up and drop the kids off at school i'll be posting the video and audio uh for everyone to get along with uh posting um uh, uh the uh video and audio of things with serene it'll all show up in a wonderful email tomorrow before i pick my kids up from school and we will get to hang out next week and remember you can respond to it with questions you pick up on things we talked about today reading this week or next week uh conversation with serene it all will be able to interact with it next week um and those questions we didn't get to that are on there will totally bring back up and i just want to tell all three people that said what is systematic theology in different areas that is a <laughs> dangerous question to ask me <laughs> yeah i skipped it adam like um, oh man yeah yeah what is this? i love the questions all the i'm here for all the questions yeah i know but I but answering the question what is systematic theology is hard yeah. um but uh but generally it's just there are about seven questions christians have asked forever and they all interrelate and the theologians that think about it and how they relate an interpretation of Christian faith, interpreters yeah. of Christian doctrine and faith. And, and, and so, but, you know, as it goes along, you can ask real baity questions like that if you want. Um, it may not get answered in the class, but I'm more than happy to talk about it on the podcast. But uh, what is systematic theology? That's dangerous. Next thing, Adam, next week I'm guessing someone's going to go, but could you be a black theologian and into process? That's that's going to show up in four four different areas, just so we yeah, get no, sidetracked. There are black process theologians. Monica I, Coleman's a black process, and she's a womanist too. I know, and you're a black theologian, and you're friends with us, and you're in a whitehead reading group with people who aren't theologians that are in whitehead. That's true, I so, am. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Look, Adam. By the end of this class, maybe you'll join the process party. <laughs> You whiteheadians, oh my goodness. Yeah. Always bring the lure. We might we, not we, we think... got to talk about Cone and Daniel Day Williams. We're going to talk about oh, that really? later on. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that came up a little bit, yes. Yeah, Spirit in the Forms of Love is one of the most beautiful books, um, which is, the I think, like kind of the only process theology book that is a full systematic. So like it's not just Cone and James Evans happen to do it for black theology. Process theology, lots of process theologians. But Daniel Day wow. Williams it wrote a one volume book, uh, Spirit in the Forms of Love, that goes through the big seven questions. Um, uh, For those who don't know who we're talking about, it, 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 give him give him a little bit of who who he is. Daniel oh, a uh, process theologian, mid twentieth century Chicago, um, and uh, it's a. Uh, Spirit in the Forms of Love is like a process. He was a colleague of Cohen in the nineteen seventies, also. Yeah. And he's, yeah, a, he's at Union Theological Seminary, so I just want to... Yeah, before that, I was at University of Chicago Divinity School. Sure, yeah, yeah. You're right. And you're, you're that's right. when he was connected with G, uh, the other JC, John Cobb, mm. <laughs> James Cohn, John yeah. Cobb. I would really like theologians with JCs in there. Uh, yeah, Jack Caputo, John Cobb, just Catherine <laughs> Keller, James Cohn. <laughs> wow. The, uh, but anyway... Um, yeah, so in, in Spirit and the Forms of Love, from a process perspective, it's one of the books that goes through the big questions like, who is God? How is God in Christ? What did God do? What is the Spirit? What is the mission and goal of the church? Uh, how, what is salvation? How is it accomplished? And uh, the end, eschatology and hope. Uh, and it does it just like Cone, uh, does it, James Evans does it. Like it's, But not all theologians do them all. You'll have some brilliant books that are like one part of one of those questions. Systematic theologian weaves them together. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the James Evans book is that it weaves them together and centers the religious experience of African Americans for thinking through the questions in ways that don't make it like this, like a sidecar. You know, like when Bat old school Batman had like the sidecar when Robin rode with him, and it's like really little, and he's just like squirreled up in the side. A like a lot of times when Euro dominant theologians try to bring in other stuff, they're like, look at my sidecar. Like there's Robin. And, uh, and it is so it, anyway, James Evans doesn't do that. And, uh, I, I found it to be really good. 
uh, it's great in a class. I've taught it three times when I taught systematic theology, the James Evans wow. book. Um, great. It's always one of the favorite things that were assigned. Anyway, mm. all right, I'm going to go to bed and. Uh, <laughs> I really care, appreciate folks. you appreciate running from class over here. Oh, you, you said, yeah, that, that was, that was, that was an effort, <laughs> but glad to be here. Glad to talk to you. Appreciate all the questions and engagement. We'll be back. Uh, and um, stay tuned for Serene. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's interview. Same bat time next week. Same bat right. channel. <laughs> all right. There we go. Take care. <laughs> Bye. So that was uh, most of the opening session. And now you're going to hear a conversation between Adam Clark and Serene Jones. And let me just say, it is excellent. What is life-giving about being a religious scholar and being the president of Union Theological Seminary? And what are some of the people and books that influence you to be who you are? So that is such a great question. I often say to people that uh, being the president of Union, I have the absolute best job in the world. Union is a unique, one-of-a-kind place. And as I was growing up in the household of a theologian and later oh. Uh, went to seminary myself. Um, from the time I began to read theology, I was reading uh, the theologians that have come out of Union's incredible history um, as a theological institution. Uh, coming to Union 14 years ago as president um, was, I should say, perhaps the biggest change of my life going from being a religion scholar, a theologian, which I absolutely loved. Uh, studying and teaching theology really allows you the big, grand sweep of history and life to engage it in all of its complexity and messiness and to form and students' minds and hearts and open their being uh, two ways of thinking about ultimate reality that uh, very few people have the privilege of doing. And I loved the teaching of theology. And the only downside to being the president of Union is that I had to dramatically cut back on my teaching of theology, mm -hmm. which will always be my first love. I live and breathe it. It is beautiful and powerful and life-changing. Well, Union is such a unique institution, and it's long been considered the home of liberation theology, especially in North America. And you became president where there are so many dramatic shifts that are changing in the religious landscape. What attracted you to come to Union, and how would you describe the kind of the new theological paradigm that Union is setting forth? Union attracted me to coming to Union. Mm -hmm. I had no desire at that point or at any point in my life to become the president of a seminary. Who who could possibly aspire to something like that? It's a very uh, a hard job. Um, but it was the possibility of being the president of Union, um, a school that I admire and continue to think is absolutely essential uh, to the future of theological education uh, globally. Uh, precisely because, as you put it, um, Union has this long history of, to quote the Charter, responding to the pressing needs and concerns of the world, um, which in each generation takes a different form. Um, and for the past 50 years has made Union uh, the center of a variety of conversations and emergent thoughts and movements around liberation theology. Uh, wow. Union is so amazing because it is never still. It uh, is a place that is so alive with the contradictions, the conflicts, the comforts, the joys, the toughness, the grand scope of all that our world is wrestling with. It comes into Union's 
um, courtyard and hallways, and it ends up in its classroom and dorm rooms as a place of conversation and contestation. And it's, it's enormously important because what comes out of that contestation and conversation are new forms of imagination that have the capacity to change people's lives. What is your earliest memory or encounter with James Cone? When I was a seminary student, 80, just probably 1982, um, James Cone um, came to the campus where I was um, to give a lecture. And because I was on the lecture committee that invited him, I got to be at a dinner party uh, with five faculty, myself and Professor Cohn. Um, at that point, I had read everything he'd written. Um, I idolized him. I couldn't believe I was sitting in the presence of the great Dr. Cohn. When he began to speak, I was just blown away uh, by this like wonderful sense of seriousness. I mean, dead seriousness about the topic of black theology. Um, a kind of also always ironic edge, you know, like a, a sort of a, um, testing edge to his comments and questions and answers. Um, and a really subtle but delightful sense of humor. Um, mm. And underneath all of this was just, you knew this man existentially lived and wrestled with the realities that he was writing about and exploring. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a theological topic for him. It was about the meaning and truth of his life as a black man in the black community and its future and the realities of its, of its harsh and yet in many ways, beautiful past. Can you discuss your relationship with Katie Cannon and Dolores Williams as well? Oh, I would love to do that. <laughs> so I first met Katie Cannon around the same time uh, when I was a young seminary student myself. Um, Letty Russell and Katie Cannon were very good friends, and they worked on a number of projects together. So um, while Katie was at Union as a student, um, she frequently came up the road uh, to New Haven, where I was living, um, for lectures, for seminars. There was a group of women in theological education um, that got together three or four times a year. Um, and Katie was part of that. So um, I would regularly have the opportunity as a student who was part of this group uh, to sit around Letty Russell's house with Katie. Um, and talk theology and ethics, and also eat lobster and uh, sing songs and talk about changing the world. And the first thing that strikes you about the person of Dr. Katie Cannon is this woman loved life and was filled with the irony and good humor of simply being alive. She could laugh and she could make you laugh. She could even make you laugh about the most horrible things in the world. <laughs> um, her, her ability to understand uh, the human condition and, and open reality to others was just incredible. I don't mm. think in terms of that level of brilliance I've ever met anyone like her. Mm. Mm. Dolores Williams. I had much less interaction with. I met her several times when, as a student in the 80s, I came to Union um, for meeting Union students for different protests as we would go down to Washington. Um, so I got to meet her occasionally, but did not have uh, that kind of sustained interaction with her. Uh, I was actually able, over the years, um, as I became a professor and then came to Union, um, developed a sustained friendship with Katie Cannon. How would you describe or how do you understand the broad kind of landscape of, landscape of academic theology currently? And where would you situate Black and womanist theology within that 
broad kind of theological landscape? Well, I think that uh, right now the academic state of theology as a big discipline is radically diverse and it's gone through such transformations and continues to be transformed that it's not one thing that you can talk about, uh, which for me is what makes it so beautiful and exciting. Um, it has become increasingly interreligious in nature. It's also opened itself to embrace not just uh, the history of religions, but uh, the broad category of spirituality and the host of really pressing social issues that come into its purview has also exponentially expanded. Uh, most importantly now uh, to include the category of uh, the earth and eco justice. And it's also um, expanded in a way that it includes much more of a focus on the practices of theology, that theology is self-reflective about itself as a kind of practice, and that those practices can be multi-form. Um, it can take the form of poetry, novel writing, podcast producing, as well as you know an academic book um, in theology. And the young scholars coming along who are doing theological work are just blow me away with their creativity the range of things that they're able to talk about and the range of platforms they're able to use. Um, I continue to think that black theology and womanist theology plays a very central role in the public understanding of academic theology because black theology and womanist theology are one of the few areas where the divide between the academy and the church and the broader public has been more fluid. Black theologians and womanist theologians from the start really lived the commitment to speaking not just to other theologians, but to churches and to broader publics. And I think that continues as well and has had a transformative effect um, on um, how uh, churches uh, think about uh, black reality in the United States, black experience, um, racism, the history of white supremacy, um, and um, in religious communities across the country, it's been black theology, womanist theology, that has really led the way in um, church and related communities work to challenge white supremacy and become anti-racist. What would you say to the critics of kind of union style of theological education who see the current state of theology as just a tower of Babel of all these identity constituencies forming these kind of sectarian pockets with no common theological core or thread or any unifying base, right? They, 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 they might glorify the heyday of union as being the Tillich and Niebuhr days if they thought that it went downhill after the 60s. What do you say to those type of critics? I say to them that our our humanity and all of its diversity is a tower of Babel. And it's a beautiful tower of Babel. And um, anything less than that uh, would mean that, that voices and perspectives about the ultimate meaning of our lives and the reality of how we live, the justice of God in the present moment uh, would not be spoken. And the more voices involved in that, the fuller and truer um, our collective reflections are. So that heyday was only a heyday because a small group of people decided it was a heyday. Um, I think that we are in a heyday now and we are gonna to continue to have more and more of that ahead of us. But it's not going to be ever again singular. Um, we're not ever again going to say, oh, there's Paul Tillich or Reinhold Niebuhr, the towering figure. Um, they were their own little Tower of Babels with their own little multifaceted world speaking theology. But now we actually have a place where many voices are speaking and it's powerful. Now, when, when I was in class with Dr. Cohn, he conceived of theology as this ongoing conversation. And 
when you took a class with him, it was like he invited you to be a critical participant within that conversation. Uh, what do you see now as the primary task of theology? And what are some of the biggest theological challenges as you see it for our times? Well, I agree with uh, Dr. Cohn that theology continues to be a critical conversation. If it stops being a critical conversation, it stops being good theology. Because without being a critical conversation, it's just the downloading of doctrine, which is deadly. And at Union, the way we teach theology, it continues to be that critical conversation. And it's a critical conversation about ultimate reality, however one names that. God, spirit, for some the Trinity, for some process theologians process. I mean, the names are are large and infinite, but um, it is, as I understand it, and as it continues to unfold at Union, conversation about, the critical conversation about ultimate reality, our place within that ultimate reality, and the urgent question of how we live together and how we exist as human beings on this planet. You know, when Cole started Black Theology, he identified his, the primary question is, what does it mean to be Black and Christian? Um, how, you know, and that was about 50 years ago. What, what do you see as the, what does Cole teach us? Maybe I should frame it this as, what does Cole teach us about the nature of Christian identity and what's at the heart of Christian faith? That remained the question for Dr. Cohn, his whole life, what does it mean to be black and Christian? Although his own teaching and writing, as his own experiences expanded, included additional voices, womanist voices, Asian voices, Latinx voices, and queer voices. His world grew larger and larger. But as it grew, that searing focus on uh, black experience and black theology remained the starting point for him. Um, And what that teaches us, I think, is that Dr. Cohn never stopped claiming the overwhelming importance of his own location um, in the world and his own responsibility to speak with and for marginal and oppressed communities of which he was a part. He never lost that linkage. He knew where he stood and who stood with him and never let go of the vocation of of advocating and struggling forward on behalf of that community. And I think that anyone who speaks as a theologian, if your feet lose touch with the ground that you stand on and who you're standing with, and you start to speak in abstractions that claim to represent the world, then you're losing touch with the specificity of your humanity, which is exactly where the content of your theology is going to flow from. Mm -hmm beauty of the incarnate theology that you speak. Yeah. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, he identified race, specifically blackness and whiteness as not just political um, categories, but theological categories. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and, you know, when I teach black theology, you know, that's one of the things that students have a hard time grasping, especially white students. Like how, what does it mean to grasp race theologically, right? And even when you go into churches to really try to think about race from a theological standpoint, how do you help pastors and kind of first year MDiv students kind of think about race theologically? Yes, you're absolutely right that for him, blackness uh, was not just a political category. And thinking about black and white in America was not it was a political category, but it wasn't just a political category. The lens through which he engaged the world was deeply theological insofar as from where he stood, 
if you were black, your experience of reality, of power structures, of what you could do with yourself in the course of a day, how your body was treated, was so radically different than the experience of standing in the privilege of whiteness. And because theology is about life and ultimate truth, where you stand and the the pressures and possibilities that come to that place that so deeply form you inform how you think about God and inform how you think about what human beings are. So for Dr. Cohn to say um, God is black is to make a very true statement about an understanding of God where God is not this figurative white man, you know, up in the cloud somewhere, but God is a reality that stands completely in solidarity with the black body um, as it as it crumbles and is crushed by the reality of white supremacy. That's where God is. And that insight into the reality of God is just blown open by the ability to embrace that. Now, do you get pushback from, yeah, I'm in the Midwest, so, <laughs> you know, we may get a different, you're in New York City. So, you know, when, when I talk to pastors about trying to talk about race in the context of faith, there's such anxiety and pushback. Do you receive that at Union or do people come there kind of knowing that, hey, this is this is what we do. And I'm, you know, I'm going to welcome being kind of formed in this atmosphere. Well, I think people come to Union uh, knowing that this is this is in the water. Um, this is in the air. This is this is what Union does. No one is shocked by it. People come wanting to have. Uh, their worlds opened up this way. But that's a different question than whether or not union, you know, actually succeeds all the time in fully living into the reality of, of what it's trying to teach. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a human community. It continues to actually struggle with all of these questions existentially, um, socially, because they're tough. They are tough and they're, they are still an intractable part of uh, reality in the United States. Mm -hmm. So union doesn't exist apart from the sure. world of yeah. white supremacy and, uh, and racism, you know. So it still feels those pressures, but at least at union, you're not surprised when they become part, a big part of the theology that you're learning. Now, you're one of the few people who can talk about Cohn as a colleague. Uh, you know, can you tell just some stories or give a description of what James Cohn was like as a colleague and kind of give a sense of what drove, what animated him? So he was a wonderful colleague. Um, he was always willing to share his work and to read your work and give you critical comments. It was not unusual for me out of the blue, having given a sermon somewhere to get an email from him saying, Serene, I listened to your sermon last night and I want to tell you how beautiful it was and how heartfelt and thank you for what you're doing in the world. That, that's a true colleague who is actually wow. listening to the voices of his colleagues um, and reading their work and pulling them into discussion. Um, when I went to visit him in his apartment, and I'm sure many people had this experience, you could sit in a chair in his living room and talk for literally hours. Um, you lose track of time as you engage in theological reflection uh, with this brilliant man. Um, and always, uh, you know, serious, but, but fun. Um, but I think uh, all of his colleagues at Union would agree that uh, even though he was a beloved colleague, he wasn't always an easy colleague. I mean, he wasn't someone who was just going to 
go with group think or, you know, agree just to be agreeable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if he was the lone voice in the room on a particular matter in which the faculty had to make a decision, he would make his position known very strong. <laughs> um, yeah, we know that. <laughs> he, was not afraid, he was not afraid of a good fight. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And he would uh, take that seriously. I mean, he took what he said and how he felt and his contribution very seriously. I called it like the kind of uncomfortable truth telling. Yes. Like he had such a way with words. He can make you either feel 10 feet tall or he could cut someone down to the ground. Like he, he just was very gifted and he had an art of saying it just the right way that it could, like I say, elevate or just really humble somebody. And he was very egalitarian in that regard. <laughs> That's right. He could elevate the the most insecure, uh, you know, student and make them feel like they were the most brilliant theologian ever. <laughs> That's right. The quick, the most erudite, famous person you've ever met. Right. And it was all in the service of truth, right? It wasn't bullying. It, it was really done in the service of truth. Um, yeah. well, well, you know, and I guess on the flip side of that, what what are the greatest misconceptions that people who've never actually met Cone have about Cone, or people, or things that you've heard people just assume about Cone that are just not true? I think many people think that because James Cone did black theology, that he wasn't a real theologian. Mm -hmm. That all he, that you know, oh, he's just concerned about blackness and race, and he's not really doing theology. And mm -hmm. that is just bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse the word, but mm -hmm. James Cone was a theologian in every cell of his body. That's right. um, he imbibed all of the classics. He continued throughout his whole life to read the corpus of what we call the history of Christian theology both the main canon and all of the canons outside of the canon. And he wrestled with theological questions. And when he was writing and teaching, he was writing and teaching students and readers about matters theological that he thought and felt were in truth matters of life and death. Mm -hmm existential power of his theological voice is remarkable. He is a, when it comes to existential force and erudition and scope of knowledge, um, he stands out as a towering figure hmm. in the last 50 years of theology. People don't get that he was trying, he was making the distinction between Christian identity and white religion. Right. And he really was trying to say that much of the commentary that people have about Christian faith, they're really just making a commentary on white religion. And he would and he really went back. He was very biblical in terms of the way he would see, see what kind of creative fidelity to Christian faith would mean. It was really a set, a set of precept, biblical precepts. But I think people miss that paradigm and the paradigm of just the non-person versus the non-believer. And I think that's why he was so misread in that way. Um, and if you ever were in conversation with him as a student or a colleague or whatever, if you started going out on a limb that lost its biblical theological grounding, mm, he would call you right back. That's right. You can go out there on that political, cultural <laughs> limb, wherever you are, yeah, talking yeah. whatever you're talking about, but you're not doing theology anymore. Let's get back to the really important thing. That's right. Let's that's ground right. it theologically. That's right. That's right. That's right. I also think that people may think that he was more of an activist than he actually was. Like he was much more of an academic. I mean, he was a classical academic in terms of what people think he's not a theologian. He was also much more of an academic than people realize. Uh, you know, so much so that he would kind of discourage people while they're in the doctoral program from getting overly committed to academics and even to the church to that matter. He said, look, that will be there after your program. Um, but he was really, um, in the best sense of the word, about 
you know, trying to get, trying to ground yourself at least for the duration of the program in the scholarship, in the literature, and really push people to um, spend, you know, sufficient amount of time with that. It wasn't jogging or sleeping. He was reading or writing theology. That's right. That's right. That's right. Higher existence. Yes. I think he read like like eight hours a day or at least six to eight hours a day. Like every day he used to tell, he used to, you know, he used to tell us about that. It was just, you know, and also his personal demeanor. Yes. Oh, yes. He, he was too, he was, I think a lot of people may have thought that he was much more, I don't know if aggressive is the word, but I think people, when they read his first two works, right, and they meet him personally, there's a disjunction. Well, first of all, because of the pitch of his voice. That's one, right? The most obvious thing. I think people think he has a much deeper voice than he actually had. It's always startling for everyone. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, and I also think people thought he might have been a physically intimidating person when he really, you know, in terms of his personal demeanor. And he, and he didn't self-project that way at all. Yeah. No, he was not an intimidating personal presence in any, in any way. Right, right. So she said he could say harsh things. That's right. No, it was with his words. It was skill. Uh, you know, in just regular conversation, a, a soft person. Uh, you know. That's right. And he used to say that about Gustavo. He says, when people say about Gustavo, say, have you met Gustavo? <laughs> and if you ever see him, he's, what, he's like barely five feet. I don't even know if he's five feet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when people read his theology, it's very different than when you actually meet him. And I think the same thing he used to say about Gustavo, I think you could say the same thing about Cohn, about that they were very different from the literature that you read initially. And both of them are very gentle human beings as well. Um, the, and that's how you know it's kind of the prophetic side of them. It's the prophetic voice that screams loud, but their personal demeanor is more gentle and a bit, well, with Cohen, I know it's it's a bit more reserved and even sometimes even reluctant to engage like large crowds. He kind of didn't necessarily, I don't think he drew life from personal interaction with large territories, unless he was very comfortable in those spaces. Yeah, the whole time that I was president at Union and working with him, he really eschewed any kind of um, interview for, yeah. uh, you know, the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Atlantic, you know, all the major, the Washington Post were always calling for comments from him. Yeah. And he yeah. said, no, I'm not going to do that. No. Yes. You know, so he was not, um, his agenda was not to create a big public platform for himself. Yeah. He really did not like that space, that public space. Um, you know, and he didn't want to, he did not seek to be a star. Well, I'm glad you said that because I was going to ask you about that because my memory, we used to try to push him because New York is just the city of celebrities. I mean, you have academic celebrities, media celebrities, entertainment celebrities. And Dr. Cohen didn't seem to, he seemed to almost consciously avoid that and not be drawn to it whatsoever. He was very... Inner, innerly driven toward his own kind of personal calling and a, and had his own personal agenda laid out and didn't want to be at this party or that party, even his own colleagues across. I mean, people might not realize how Union is right across the street from Columbia University. And, you know, Dr. Cohen didn't really have like a whole bunch of like close, intimate friends that were university professors at Columbia or that type of thing. It didn't seem to even have a care about that. And I remember as students, we used to try to push him and say, hey, why don't you go hang out with Manny Marable or something like that? And he just didn't seem to have an interest in that. I don't know if that's changed or people, would you just said, did people call the school wanting to have contact with him? Um, and, did, you know, to your knowledge, he just kind of just avoided that life altogether or was he connected in any way that we might not know about? We frequently would get calls. They usually come through my office for asking for an interview or comment. At first, I passed them along, and then I just stopped passing them along. Like, no, there was That's right. Um, and he was not a big socializer. You know, the yeah. salon view of 
um, academic life was not Dr. Cohn's view of academic life. That said, he did have um, with professors at Columbia and with major figures, um, many individual relationships where okay. they would have okay. meaningful conversations one-on-one. Okay. And that there was deep shared respect and knowledge of each other's work and, and connection. Who are some of the most unexpected relationships he would have with other academics? This is not an academic, but um, he, he, he had a great friendship with Bill Moyers. Mm, okay. Yeah. Who was, you know, a star. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. A major public figure. Um, you wouldn't necessarily think Bill Moyers, James Cone, um, but but good friends, good friends. They have a great interview. I mean, I, I still use that in my classroom on the cross and the lynching tree. It was very interesting to near the end of his teaching career. Uh, he started teaching James Baldwin. Yes, uh, yes. That um, had a real impact on him. I remember one conversation that we had about James Baldwin um, was about what a powerful writer Baldwin was and how much attention Baldwin gave to language and to its poetry and its beauty. And I remember uh, Dr. Cohn talking about the fact that when he taught uh, Baldwin, the students in the class wrote better. Mm. did better theology because they paid more attention to language and that it was teaching Baldwin was making him pay more attention to the, he was always concerned about the prophetic power of his words, but not necessarily the poetic power of his words. Mm -hmm. And and Baldwin had both of those. And I think it was like in, in those Last five, six years, there was a sort of a poetic awakening in, in uh, Cone that Baldwin provoked. Um, and we see those last two books come out of that sort of more attention to the texture of language and how it's used and how images work. Yeah. He, he said that Baldwin helped him combine both King and X, right? He also said Du Bois did the same, right, from earlier, from a kind of different perspective. But, yeah, I remember him talking a lot about Baldwin, especially d- during the last part. Um, how would you describe James Cone as a classroom teacher? And what was his impact on the student body at um, Union? So I never had the chance to actually study with him. Um, mm-hmm. But I know that when he teaches... It is so loud that I can sit in my office and <laughs> so I feel like I've sat in his classrooms. All right, right, right. Yeah. And, um, after his uh, systematic theology class, his theology, his black theology class, after almost every lecture, you would hear thunderous applause. Every class was like uh, a powerful intellectual experience and a powerful personal experience mm-hmm. as he was demanding that you take it seriously because mm. theology is serious business and um, it's not something that you can do lightheartedly or uh, without embracing the volatility and the scope of what it is you're taking on when you do theology and he mm. wanted students to understand it desperately so it was a total it was a total body experience to sit in a cone classroom hmm. and to be in the presence of someone who, who was the inner light that theology, that black theology lit in him was so powerful. You could see it. Hmm. Now, now you talked briefly about celebrities or people like uh, Bill Moyers, his relation with Bill Moyers. What about with the denominational church or pastors either locally or nationally. Did you ever get calls from just either celebrity pastors or major denominational church representatives about Cohen and wanted to lend his name to that? Or did he have any unexpected relationships with 
you know, heads of denominations or pastors that we may not know about? Not that I know of. I never got okay. calls through my office. I know that he and Jim Forbes were friends. I know that he was a member at Riverside Church, and I'm also a member at Riverside, so I would occasionally see him on Sunday morning uh, sitting in the back corner, hoping not to be seen, but coming for yeah. the sermon, yeah. slipping in in time for the sermon, avoiding the songs, and then getting out as soon as it's <laughs> Um, Sounds familiar. <laughs> I, you know, he loved the black church, but it was too much of a constraint on his thought to be bound by the black church. Hmm. And so I think it was a real tensive relationship to him, both one of love and of his own resistance to it. And what about any activist organizations in New York City? I'm trying to really think about Cone as just be not just a creature of or product of Union Theological Seminary formation, but what about New York City as a whole in terms of that? Um, how did he navigate New York City? I mean, um, I know he talks a lot about Harlem, right? And how Harlem had like a real, just the kind of materiality of black bodies, how that had a real impact on his writing and thinking. I'm wondering if there's any type of relationships that would be kind of, uh, that you know, most people wouldn't know about in terms of his connection with New York City. I think that there were major black artists, black figures in New York City that he followed their work. Mm. Some of them he knew. I remember when The Cross and the Lynching Tree first came out, I went to a, I actually spoke at a book party for him that was held in Midtown and it was hosted by Anna DeVere Smith and like all of the sort of the theater group uh, that, that Anna's in were there and it was in a barbershop that had been turned into a reception space so we were like all the snacks were on barbershop chairs and owner of the salon, this wonderful trans man um, who also had the black trans community was there in full form. And then the union community was there. And then there was some church community there. And then you had the theater community. It was just this wild mix of people. And um, we were all sitting there in awe of this man who wrote The Cross and the Lynch Tree. It was, it was yeah. so like... I'll never forget yeah. that that barbershop yeah. being all fixed up for the reception place for this book on the cross and the lynching tree. Wow. Uh -huh. But that was uh -huh. a New York moment and that could not have happened anywhere else in that way. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, you're also one of the few people who actually seen Cone's library. Right. And I think people would be surprised at how diverse <laughs> like his reading practices were. And most people who are not theologians probably aren't aware that theologians don't, don't really read academic theology on their spare time, right? <laughs> they usually read, they find things outside of theology to be more life-giving. I was wondering if you could tell people some of the things that you saw Cohn really have a passion in, what books that he had a real passion for, that he really enjoyed, that he felt he delighted in because every time he would have a book, he would just share it with everybody that something that really touched and moved him. What are some of the things he shared with you? Well, of course, anything Baldwin wrote, you know, became just a blessed sacred text to him. In the back part of his apartment was his study and it was just floor to ceiling books and filing cabinets. And every book he read, he took meticulous notes on and then filed it away under the name of the book and the author in his filing cabinet. So you could see notes in these voluminous filing cabinets on every book he'd ever read. You could see the ones that got a lot of use. Like you could tell that, um, you know, Niebuhr's Nature and Destiny of Man, uh, he went back to all the time. Mm. Uh, sometimes mm. probably to rip it up, uh, but, it was, <laughs> but it was a key, it was a key, uh, text for him. Of course, he had massive amounts of biblical studies um, texts. Um, he had a, a huge section of novels. Um, he also, most people don't realize, read 
newspapers and commentary, political commentary, constantly. He oh. read several newspapers a day. He read opinion columns. He knew exactly what was going on in the larger world and the political stakes um, at play and who was writing about, about what. Um, so he read very widely in terms of, of politics. And so the and stack of newspapers was always tall, as were journals. About anything he could get his hands on, he was consuming all the time. Yeah, because I mean, I was a research assistant, so he would always kind of, I, I'd have to go to the stacks before we were computerized and <laughs> had to like get those books. And he would just, and sometimes he would just see a, a bibliographical note and just like go, just go deep with it and just, um, he say, you know, and also ask us what we're reading. Like he would ask other people, like, what's turning them on? What's lighting their fire? And um, really pursue that as well. Um, you know, and when you said in terms of him having like a kind of a global or, or international perspective, you know, his books were, trans what, I think it was 11 languages, his books. I can't remember how many, but a, a lot of different languages. And most people at, are just associate Cohen with the black American community. But he was such a international global figure Um Especially, you know, working probably most intensely when he was with EWAT, which is the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of, you know, can you speak to kind of Cone as kind of a international or global figure? Uh, you know, and he's, I know he got doctoral students applying from all over the world, and I'm not sure how many contacts people had with you about your office, I should say, about. Cone, but can you speak to him as being like a world teacher? Yes, I do believe that his uh, joining Eatwalk um, had a really transformative effect on his theology. Uh, because through Eatwalk, uh, two things happened. One was that he developed deep and sustaining relationships with liberation theologians from all over the globe. And really for the first time, had the chance to, in a sustained way, hear about and you know experience in relation to uh, the reality of oppressions other than the experience of being a black man in America, and the sort of those relationships, the people that he met and became connected to deeply, changed his view. And then secondly, with Eat Watt, he had the chance to travel um, and in particular travel to Africa and India um, and to, throughout Asia. And those travels opened his eyes and his experience to such radically different realities of oppression yeah. and injustice. And, and once you walk through those streets, you can't unsee them. Um, mm -hmm. And you could never un undo the life-altering expansion that Eat Watt brought to him in terms of his view of oppression and injustice. You know, and when I think of actually, you know, back to when you, you know, your commentary on Bill Moyer kind of fascinates me. And the only other person that I can think of that Cohn used to speak glowingly about He's not well. He's not a celebrity to him, but to a lot of people, he is. It's Cornell West. He he spoke. I was there after his f first stint at Union, um, a long time after that. But you were you were the president during his second stint of Cohn and West together. I'm wondering if you could speak on their relationship and their impact on Union Theological Seminary and what theological education was like when they were both together. That's a unique time, and I know people were really excited about that. How was that, you know, you being the president when that was actually occurring? That's a unique time in history. They have a really deep and abiding love for each other. Yeah. And when they were together, especially at dinner with just a small group of people, oh, they could laugh. They, they somehow <laughs> just found each other's funny bone and would just laugh, laugh, laugh. Cornell was one of the few people that I think could keep up with and had a grasp of the scope of Cone's mind mm. Mm. and respected that. Um, and 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 because his own mind is so massive, you know. So here you have these two capacious intellects. 
um, coming together. And I mostly remember when the two of them were together, uh, how they like to play off of each other and the humor of it all and the playfulness mm. of it. Mm. Just a real sense of camaraderie. Like here I'm with someone who knows me and I'm going to relax and I'm going to have a good time. And no pretense, no competition, no trying to show who's smarter, who's quicker, you know, who has the best quip. Just good hearted, good humor, good love and big brains. So they and they were a powerhouse together. And what was wonderful, too, is that when they were in public, like a on a panel together, for instance, or doing something at a union event, they didn't hesitate to disagree with each other. Yes. Yes. Public. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I right. can, I can hear Cornell saying now, Jim, <laughs> I can hear Jim saying now Cornell, you know, now Cornell. but you know, they both would, you know, challenge each other, call each other to account. When they launched their harshest criticism, they elicited a laugh from the other one. Right. You know, usually like, well, you're right. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem I got there. <laughs> and I think that's what it was. I mean, it was a pushing. And that's what he'd always tell me that he said, Cornell pushes me like nobody can push me. And I, I, I think that that really he extended. Oh, he loved it. Yeah. He loved it. It was good humor, good hearted pushing, but it was real pushing. Right, right, right. It was that kind of iron sharpens iron. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful to witness. And the students loved it. Um, Yeah, that's what I was kind of curious about, how they benefited. Like, did they actually co-teach or how how did that work? Um, No, Cornell West and James Cone never actually taught a class together, although they were often in public conversation together. Okay, okay. And they were often around the same dinner table together, which was my dinner table, because I lived right above... Uh, okay, okay. right below Cornell. So, and um, neither one of them were particularly good at things like ordering food and <laughs> you know, knives and forks and making sure that there was enough wine for everybody. You know, I work at an institution, uh, Xavier University, and with tuition going up to sixty, seventy thousand dollars a semester, we have a hard time getting majors, and not just us. Any type of arts and science majors, it's very difficult to get people to major in this. I'm wondering how, what would be your pitch to talk about the value of receiving an MDiv? And what type of students are the students that, that, you know, attend Union Theological Seminary? Uh, What do you look for? And how do you, you know, what's your pitch about the value of even getting theologically trained in this current climate? At Union, the MDiv remains the strongest program, even though one of the external perceptions is that union isn't very Christian or very theological. Uh, But in fact, it has uh, more students going into ministry, Christian ministry and filling pulpits than many of the seminaries surrounding us in the Northeast. But the students come because for many of them, they've had an experience of having their world blown open by a course they've taken. And they start asking really big questions about how we make sense of the world we find ourselves in. And they start exploring the question of, what does it mean to work for justice? And if you're asking big questions and you're committed to working for justice, where are you supposed to go to continue that work as an intellectual and practical endeavor. I mean, we don't have other places in our intellectual academic world that engages that combination of things. And that those two things combined are often what strikes students so powerfully during their undergraduate education. And getting an MDiv demands that you both ask theologically and philosophically huge questions. So you get to do that, that mind blowing, mind expanding wrestling. At the same time, you're required to think about it as all of these questions having ethical implications, meaning these are not just abstractions. They impact how people live together and they always have a special location. And there's always the question of justice. Are they making the world better or not? 
Um, mm. Are they improving lives for those who suffer or not? And then you get this third piece, which is so on the ground practical. You have to go have a field education placement in you know, a church where you have to visit people in the hospital who are struggling with diabetes or drug addiction. All of those things get wrapped up together into one place that is completely transformative of how you understand the world. It's wildly abstract, deeply ethical, and really in the dirt grounded in the reality of life. And, and you mentioned ministry. Uh, you know, most people, when they see, hear ministry, they think of church almost exclusively. I know Dr. Cohn saw the classroom as a ministry. Uh, could you speak to just how Union sees, you know, the broadness of the term ministry and what people, what the population is, the different types of ministries that people are called to when they attend Union? Well, it's interesting, but the still the majority of of people who graduate with him did go into very traditional uh, church leadership uh, in mm-hmm. pulpits around the country. Great. Um, union students don't usually seek to be the big pulpit pastors, although sometimes they end up there, um, but they're serving churches. But they're also um, doing community organizing. Uh, many of them are becoming professors, like Adam Clark. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, many of them are going on into um, other professions and getting additional degrees. Um, but having an MDiv, let's say, and then getting a law degree uh, gives you a really distinct edge um, when you're doing the work, let's say, in the public defender's office in terms of how you, you think about what it means to give a public defense for all people. So they're doing just a huge variety of things. There's no limit on it. But, I, but I'm always heartened to see how many end up just being pastors. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad you're mentioning that because Union doesn't have that kind of public reputation for that. But yeah, I'm, I'm, there is a primary church calling, an ecclesial calling, even if it's not necessarily a senior pastor, although some do, as in. Raphael Warnock, right? <laughs> but many do. But it, um, it's just, you know, there's, there's a certain reimagining that's being done with ministry in just most seminaries and seeing calling as more than just, a, you know, religiously ex- explicit calling, but a calling to kind of heal and repair the world. Right. And that could be done from a number number of different sites. And that's what I appreciate the most about my, you know, union experience. I find that union graduates, wherever you go in the United States or around the world, are a really important ongoing support group for each other because of the depth of their knowledge that healing and repairing the world is the calling. Yes. Yes. Whatever form that takes, uh, call is great and the strength it takes to do it is mighty absolutely absolutely supporting each other in that is is i just love to see it to witness absolutely that, that alumni support well, yes the union alumni really embraced john lewis's good trouble right sometimes a little too much but <laughs> But, they do it for their whole life, you know. It's not like they, they stop doing it and they leave Union. They definitely do it at Union, which is great. But they do it their whole life. They make good trouble. They do good <laughs> trouble. Good trouble. We're gonna we're gonna do that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Appreciate your time and appreciate your comments. This has been beautiful. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this and great questions and good conversations. <laughs> great. Thank you.